Okay, welcome everyone. Good morning. Midmurray Council would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional custodians of the land, the Nadjeri, Naywong, Nangaraku, Narkat, Naranjeri, and Paramak peoples of the Midmurray Lands and Waters. It's upon their ancestral lands and waters that the Midmurray Council meets and operates, and Council pays respect to elders past and present and their spiritual beliefs that are of continuing importance to those First Nations peoples of today. <coughs> Council further acknowledges the contributions and important role that the First Nations peoples continue to play within the community, and we extend that respect to any people in attendance here today. And welcome to the two people in the gallery, even though one is staff. <laughs> uh, attendance. We have an apology from Councillor Caladigo. Everybody else wants to be here. Confirmation of minutes. Um, the first one is that the minutes of the ordinary council meeting held on the 18th of June 2024 be taken as read and confirmed. We have a mover, Councillor Davis and Councillor Barber. Any comments on that? Not we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. And the second one is that the minutes of the special council meeting held on the 25th of June 2024 be taken as read and confirmed. We have a mover, Councillor Hammond, and Councillor Barber is seconding that. Any comments on that? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. Declaration of interest. Let's go around the room. No. 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 That's it. And thanks for me. Uh, business adjourned is nil, deputations is nil, petitions is nil. 9.1 monthly financial report 2024. The recommendation is that the report be received. We've got a mover, Councillor Schultz, and Councillor Topcheck McPeak is seconding that. Do we have any discussion questions on that item? Councillor McGregor. Um, good morning, all this way there, Mayor. Um, just uh, in regards to the uh, rates collection, um, I know that we've sort of been through our first launch and we're sort of going through that. This launch is a quick word. Um, will we be doing a second launch and how is that sort of triggered? We, do we need another motion to make that happen so we sort of continue that process? Through Bailey. Um, so, uh, no, Council's already endorsed the process. Um, on the first tranche. Um, and so uh, a report will come back to the next council meeting to provide an update, um, just to you know, probably reinforce the next step because that'll be about the advertising and then progression to sale. Um, so um, unless Clive, do you want to add anything else to that? <coughs> yes. Councillor McGregor was wondering if we need to add something to get the next lot, because um, obviously now more three year and above. Oh, sorry, did I misinterpret your yeah. question? Yeah. So not the ones that have been processed no, at the moment. They're, they're sort of been oh, the ones the next, that are three yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, the next lot of three years coming up. Yeah. Not past yeah. it, sorry, yeah. I misinterpreted that. Due, due to the complexity of the of, of the, the process, I wouldn't recommend um, starting a second round without um, basically committing to the last step of the, the first round. Yeah. And um, what will happen in, uh, there's been a number of uh, repayment plans obviously um, scheduled mm -hmm. uh, and staff have been monitoring those so that if a number of those drop out, they will automatically be placed into the second round as well. Thank you. Uh, so it's fair to say, Clive, obviously we've worked through the process, we're working through the process, so we'll complete the first tranche yeah. and then we can, um, given the learnings from our um, process, yeah. we can implement the second yeah. um, stage at that point. Um, Thank you. Any further questions or discussion on that item? Councillor Tussock. Yes, I'm not sure whether it's here or in one of the, in the long-term financial plan, but I just had a query about the community grants amount uh, that's put in for this year coming. I can't remember that we actually made a decision about the amount of the grant. It's been rolled over as it was, which is fine, because I don't think we actually, we had a discussion about the committee grants, but I don't think we actually ended up saying whether we wanted to continue them as they are, or whether we want to reduce the amount and to encourage people to go elsewhere for community grants.
uh, through Main Valley. Uh, so um, the a fifty thousand dollar fee figure is included in the current budget, which will be considered as part of nine point two and nine point three. Um, so that's obviously up to council's discretion whether they want to reduce that. Um, but that's what been included, which is consistent. Um, the only decision council made to, was not to roll over. I think it was around eight thousand yeah. um, dollars that was unspent this fight. Sorry, last financial year. Um, so you know you, you can interpret that at forty two thousand dollars out of the fifty thousand dollars was allocated last year um, versus the fifty thousand dollar budget. And just because there is a budget um, doesn't mean it needs to be spent. If the grants committee um, make a decision that there's not enough eligible um, applications, which then would be recommended to council. And council can also make a decision when it comes back to council. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so furthermore, um, the elements of the criteria, I think the council updated the policy, I think it was January, um, where it was around the 50-50 contribution and other criteria. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's right. <coughs> Any further questions for action for 9.1? But if not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. 9.2 is the adoption of the long term financial plan 2024 25 to 2023 34. And the recommendation is that the report be received, that Council consider the feedback from public consultation on the draft long term financial plan 24 25 to 23 2033 34. In exercise of the power contained in section 122 of the Local Government Act 1999 and Regulation 5 of the Local Government Financial Management Regulations 2011, having considered all submissions in accordance with section 122 1AA of the Local Government Act 1999, the long term financial plan 2425 to 3334 be adopted. Do we have a mover? Councillor Hammond, Councillor McGregor is seconding that. Do we have any question or discussion on that item? Councillor McGregor. Hello, you're all saying welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> so there, um, just in regards to the um, uh, long-term financial plan on page nine, it mentions um, that there's a few positions still vacant. Um, I'm just interested if we can get an update on those positions at some stage, not necessarily now. And also because we've got the sustainability measures in review. So I'm assuming that we will see some um, staff, maybe some staff capacity so perhaps they can sort of fill some of those roles. Just the, my thoughts. Uh, through Mayor Bailey. Uh, so on the vacancies, um, we currently have Twelve vacancies uh, in a permanency. Um, some of those roles are currently filled by um, either agency staff or casual staff. To um, whilst we consider our strategic plan and the budget. Um, so, to answer the second part of that question, um, depending on the sustainability measures, for example, consideration of uh, what we do with swimming pools then um, those vacant positions will potentially be considered um, and whether we need them moving forward. Um, so that will be part of that process. Um, I will say that part of the reason why we haven't filled some of those vacant positions is because we wanted to finalise the treaty plan to understand if that was still a priority moving forward, that area. Um, also um, was the sustainability measures. So it gave us some flexibility um, to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I can provide more detail on those vacancies if you wish, or your, if that answers um, your question? That answers my question. Thank you. Thank you, and welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions? <laughs> if not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. And 9.3 is the adoption of the 24-25 annual business plan and budget and declaration of rates. And 
That's a big one. We will go through one by one. Um, recommendation that the report be received in exercise of the power contained in one section, section 123 of the Local Government Act 1999 and Regulation 6 of the Local Government Financial Management Regulations 2011, having considered all submissions received during public consultation in accordance with section 1236 of the Local Government Act 1999, Council's public consultation policy in respect of the financial year ending 30 June 2025. Council adopts the 24-25 annual business plan for the 24-25 financial year ending 30 June 2025, as set out in attachment one of this report. The CEO is authorised to make amendments to the document to prepare it for final publication. Is that the first motion? <coughs> Yeah. Have we got a mover for that item? Councillor Barber and Councillor Hammond, who's seconding that. Do we have any discussion on that part? No? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. The next part is the adoption of the 24-25 budget. And the motion is in exercise of the power contained in section 1237 of the Local Government Act 1999 and Regulation 6 of the Local Government Financial Management Regulations 2011, having considered the budget in conjunction with and determined the budget to be consistent with the Council's annual business plan, the Council adopts the 24-25 budget for this financial year and in 20, 30 June 2025, as set out in attachment two to this report, comprising of the following statements, the budget statement of comprehensive income, budget of financial position, budget statement in of changes in equity, budget cash flow statement, budget uniform presentation of finances, and the budget financial indicators. Have we got a mover for that? Councillor McGregor and Councillor Hammond is seconding that. Do we have any questions or thoughts, discussion on that part of the motion? If not, We'll put the motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. Division, please. A division? Sure. Can anyone who voted yes affirmative stay up? Okay. And please, Council, if you can speak against an item, you're more than welcome. So I'm happy to, you know, slow it down. I well, already gave my opinion at okay. the meeting. So I'm not going to read it. Right? Perfect. Uh, recommendation adoption of valuations of land for the purpose of rating. This one is the re uh, motion is pursuant to section 167 2A of the Local Government Act 1999. The council adopts the most recent valuations of the capital value made by the valuer general for rating purposes for the financial year ending 30 June 2025. The total at valuations for the area aggregate is $4,340,798,900, of which $4,219,970,909 is a valuation of rateable land. That's a lot of are we on a mover for that? <laughs> Councillor Hammond and Councillor McGregor, do we have any um, discussion on that? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. Attribu att attribution of land use. The recommendation is that Council adopt the categories of land use as prescribed in Regulation 14 of the Local Government General Regulations 2013 and shall be used to designate land uses in the assessment record. Do we have a mover? Councillor Hammond, Councillor Barber, do we have any questions? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that's carried. 
recommendation of the Declaration of General Rates, having taken into account the general principles of rating contained in Section 150 of the Local Government Act 1999 and the requirements of Section 152, uh, 53.2 of the Local Government Act, pursuant to Sections 153.1b and 156.1c of the Local Government Act, Council declare differential general rates for financial year ending 30 June 2025 on the capital value of all rate of men within the area varying according to the land use as follows, and all are 0 0.3944 cents in the dollar with the exception of primary production, which is 0 0.3550 cents in the dollar. Do we have a mover? Councillor Touching Peak and Councillor Davis. Do we have any discussion on that, Councillor Touching Peak? Um, I mean, a lot of people will be aware of uh, the rate in the dollar that was put out for community consultation. And I just want to say that two things. One is that I'm really, really pleased to see how we've been able to bring that down since that consultation happened. I think that's a great result for the community. Um, and I also want to just acknowledge the work by the staff that has gone into actually getting us here. Thank you. Any further questions, discussions? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. <coughs> Declaration of minimum rates pursuant to section 158.1a of the Local Government Act 1999, Council fixes a minimum rate amount of $988 payable by way of general rates on rateable land within the area of council for the financial year ending 30 June 2025. Do we have a mover? Councillor Hammond and Councillor Barber seconding that. Any discussion on that item? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. Recommendation of general rate cap, that pursuant to section 153.3 of the Local Government Act, Council determines that for the financial year ending 30 June 2025, it will not fix a maximum increase in the general rate to be charged on rateable land that constitutes the principal place of residence of a principal rate payer because Council provides relief of this nature of a rate cap for properties pursuant to section 166.1L of the Act. We have a mover, Councillor Hammond, and a seconder, Councillor Davis. Any discussion on the general rate cap? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. Recommendation, declaration of separate rates, regional landscape levy. The recommendation is that in exercise of the power contained in section 69 of the Landscape South Australia Act 2019 and section 154 of the Local Government Act, in order to reimburse council the amount contributed to the Murray Lands and River Land Landscape Board being $618,709, a separate rate of 0 0.01478 cents in the dollar be declared based on rateable land in the council's area for the financial year in 30 June 2025. We have a mover, Councillor Hannon and a seconder, Councillor Barber, and any discussion? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. Declaration of separate rates, Manor Waters. Um, I'm not going to read that one because that's a long one. <laughs> Everyone gets that. Have we got a mover for that? Councillor McGregor and a seconder. Councillor Touching with Peak. Any discussion on that one? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour against that is carried declaration of service rates and service charges community wastewater management system again i will take this as being read is there a lot of units there uh, do we have a mover councillor barber and a second councillor davis thank you any questions councillor schultz am i correct in thinking that this stayed the same, this only went up this year, but the last two years it stayed the same amount. <clears throat> so uh, through the chair and the rates for CMWS because of the impact of the flood and the distortion of the amount of expenditure and claims that we're still processing through 
uh, insurances and also the SAS recovery fund. Mm -hmm. It was decided and it is documented that the the um, service um, the service amounts would go up by three point one percent. Just just as um, until we can uh, we can finalise all those claims from those two different uh, areas, insurance and uh, the state government. And then at that stage, we'll go back to looking at the past five years of what the average uh, cost has been to run those schemes and ensure that on that average and index a little bit for more for inflation, that we recover that amount in the forward year and also ensure that there's at least um, 150% as, as a target in the fund for each CMWS to allow for um, capital renewal. Um, by, and in the, if you have a look in the annual business plan, not only the, do we actually have the uh, rates per unit as per the maintenance, we actually have the balances of the CWS schemes. And there are a couple which are still running in a deficit, but they are actually, even at this stage, their rates are actually um, higher than the, the annual expenditure. So they're gaining. Uh -huh. Thank you. This might have been answered by that question, but I'll just look. Um, and then so because of the flood and the effects it had in different areas being so variant, is that why we see per unit the cost varying so greatly depending on the regions and where they are or the complexities of the swims in those areas and all of that? So um, not the flood hasn't uh, basically um, distorted those amounts. Mm -hmm. It's it's basically a lot of times the complexity or the let's say the quality of the scheme that would have been built originally. Yeah. Um, and also there is definitely like an economy of scale. So if you've got a scheme which has only got six houses mm -hmm. versus one of the largest ones like Blanchetown, which is kind of, I can't remember um, round nearly up to around the three hundred. Mm. Obviously, the Blanchetown scheme, mm. uh, because it's servicing more, has got that economy scale and it's cheaper to run uh, those rather than those six. Yeah. More exclusive. Yeah. Okay. So I got it because there was such a difference of unit in the area and I figured that was why. But, Bob, well, I'm disappointed you didn't bring up the Go Go Mobile versus the BMW. Yeah. That's how we've described it in the past. I actually <laughs> bought a Go Go Mobile and it's starting to get parts and things, whereas if you've got the really good system at the start and they buy in at the start. Keep that running. <laughs> Jeff would love that. We love it. Uh, <laughs> any else. further questions or discussion on that item? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. Uh, declaration of service charges, Bokeel Multi Access Television Transmission Service um, of $146. Do we have a move up for that item? Councillor Tocek and Peak and Councillor Barber is seconding that. Do we have any questions or discussion on that? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. Declaration of service charges, Bohill reticulated water supply system. Um, and that is that per property is $256, including 120 kilolitres of water. And all were consumed in excess of that would be at 40 cents per kilolitre. Do we have a mover for that? Councillor Hammond and Councillor McGregor is seconding that. Do we have any questions, discussion on that? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. Declaration of service charges, township waste collection, general waste and recyclable service pursuant to section 155 of the Local Government Act in respect of the prescribed service of curbside waste collection, general waste and recyclables for the financial year ending 30 June 25. Council imposes an annual service charge of $313 based upon the nature of the service in respect of the residential property within a township um, general waste collection service. Have a mover for that. Councillor Davis, thank you, and Councillor Barber. Do we have any questions? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. Declaration of service charges, rural non township general waste <coughs> collection service. So because they don't have recycling, it's $223. Do we have a mover for that? Councillor Hammond and Councillor Davis. Any Discussion on that item? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. Rate rebates. 
pursuant to section 44 of the Local Government Act 1999 for the financial year ending 30 June 2025, delegates its power to the Chief Executive Officer or his nominee to determine applications to grant a discretionary rebate of rates in accordance with section 166 of the Local Government Act 1999. So uh, just through you, Mayor Bailey, um, we're going to uh, suggest to have a, a suspension of okay. um, yeah, short-term suspension so we can have a conversation around uh, discretionary re rebates um, so that it can inform a decision by council um, on the potential uh, motion that that moves forward. Sure. Do we have two thirds of the room agreeing to a short-term suspension? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. I think we will um, go out for 10 minutes. Uh, 20 minutes, 20 I think. Minutes. I think there's a draft motion on the... Okay. 20 minutes, 20 minutes. everyone's okay with that. Not of heads, perfect. Okay. Um, so, as you know, from a sustainability measures, um, there's two types of rebates that are provided to um, categories, uh, being mandatory rebates, obviously split council doesn't have any decision making power on, um, and then there's discretionary rebates, um, which council has a decision, and um, that is usually delegated to myself. Um, so Clive and I have worked through that, um, a report has been provided previously to council um, we've tried to ascertain information from all of those entities that receive discretionary rebates. Um, unfortunately, uh, it was uh, not an easy process. Um, a number of organisations provided it um, quite easily. We had to write again to uh, another uh, to a, a group. Um, I think it was about 13 or 14, but quote me on that number, um, that we had to get further information. And there's still gaps in the information we've provided. Um, what we've tried to do is consider how we assess um, in some objective way a decision around whether an organisation gets a discretionary rebate. Now, that discretionary rebate might be from anywhere to 100% um, to 50% or to 25% or some determination in, in between. Some organisations get a mandatory rebate, for example, 75%. Um, and then others will get, um, uh, so 75% mandatory and then 25% discretionary. And it's up to council's um, decision whether they get the full 25% or not. I don't want to confuse people, but 100% of the 25%. Um, now, most of these, or all of these are community organisations. They fall into categories, Clive, such as um, aged care, hospitals, um, community groups, sporting clubs, halls, um, recreation, youth centres, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, the criteria, are they providing community benefit to Mid-Murray Council? Are they providing community benefit to uh, residents or um, people outside of the uh, council region? Um, what is their revenue? Um, what is their capacity to pay? Um, how much are they getting from a discretionary rebate? Some of that is minimum rates. Some of that is um, on, it's all on the capital value. Uh, but if the capital value of their uh, land and buildings client is um, not, doesn't warrant uh, more <coughs> minimum rates, then they obviously get a, a greater um, rebate as part of, part of that. Um, so we wanted to have a discussion on that, Clive. Um, is there anything you want to add as we continue that discussion? No, I, I think that uh, clarifies it. So, yeah, so what we looked at is, I suppose there was obviously um, probably uh, like three three groups. There's there's a lot of community groups that look after halls, um, recreation type areas, which um, if council were not to give that rebate, that rebate percentage as, as a percentage of their total amount of income would be quite a lot of money, could be you know, up to 50%. And that would obviously um, cause those organisations to fold and council would not want to be in that situation because basically um, there, there's some great organisation people out there giving services to councils, whether they be all recreation centres that, um, that definitely do deserve 100% of their rates to be uh, rebated. Um, then I suppose when we were going through the process, um, uh, we got to another category was where the turnover was kind of like, well, it's nearly like um, a small, very small business. Um, and then we then saw another higher category with a quite large turnover and say, well, that is 
like a very like a commercial business in 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 its nature. So that's I suppose the initial process that we went through in looking at and seeing what differences we could have. So those organisations, if we take, you know, we talked about the lower end, we wouldn't want to touch those. Then if we talk about the, the upper end, which, which have multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars of turnover, how much as a percentage of, of rebate we're giving to them is a percentage of their total turnover. And then it was obviously that, well, it's a very, very small percentage. You know, in some instances, only it was like you know, one, one, you know, one and a half percent. So in reality, how much is council really supporting those organisations in comparison to us looking at our sustainability and ensuring that our money, go, if we're going to give rebates, give it to them in the right place, rather than, I suppose, previously, um, we looked at uh, previously the council has said, well, if you fit the criteria, we'll give you up to um, the total amount of rebate to have no rates payable in the end. So as Ben said before, there's a number of areas and it's basically in the education area and the community services where there's mandatory rebates of about 75%. So, um, and then there, then the last 25% is up to the discretion of council to get that extra last 25%. Um, and then basically the base, uh, the balance of all of, o, uh, of it is 100% discretionary. There's no split between that mandatory, which we're quite under the, the Act, and like a top up if you want to call it. So, so can I give an example? There might be a hall, and they, and again, we've got to consider profit and turnover, I suppose, because sometimes an organisation could have high uh, turnover, but then um, their operating costs are um, equally across. Uh, council, sorry. for example. For council, for example. <laughs> um, so there might be a hall that has revenue of Five thousand um, dollars, and the rebate that they get is minimum rates, which is nine hundred and twenty-five last financial year. So you know that's seventeen um, percent. Uh, not sorry, it's six. What's the math? It's, it's, it's about it's about a fifteen percent. Fifteen percent. Fifteen percent of their actual revenue is a um, is what they get from a rebate. Whereas an organisation might have four or five hundred thousand dollars in turnover, and they're getting minimum rates or they're getting you know twice minimum rates which might be two thousand um so it's much more okay. insignificant um or material to that organization for their capacity to generate that revenue and we've had that conversation um on um financial assistance grants you know you've got an organization with 200 million dollars of um rate for revenue uh that are getting two million dollars versus us that um you know we're missing out on four million dollars okay. seven million dollars um we get four yeah. um but we've got a uh, turnover of um, you know, $30 million or rate revenue of $20 million. So that's probably what we're trying to um, ascertain is that capacity to pay um, the re rebate. So we want to make sure we're supporting the organisations. Okay. And I'm not, that's, we're not saying that these organisations that have the ability to get discretionary rates aren't doing good work in the community. Mm -hmm. It's just, do we, in our current position, want to be subsidising um, all of the organisations the same way, which is what we've done in the past. Um, so, Clive, is there on that? That's, that's, that's I you. think that covers it, yeah. So um, what we would like to discuss and get some feedback from council is potentially um, some categories or classifications on how we determine that. So it's not just um, you are, as I said, they're all ticking the box of community benefit. Um, it's depending on where they fit. So one of the options that we could do is um, revenue or profit um, or turnover. Um, and, you know, it could be, for example, an organisation that has, I'll use revenue for the want of the discussion, over $250,000 that potentially they don't get a rebate in the discretionary sense. Um, there could be a category between 100 and 200,000, for example, that maybe they get 50% of the potential discretionary rebate. And anything under 100,000, um, maybe they get the whole rebate. And I will say most of the organisations are getting minimum rates um, as their rebate, um, I would say. Um, and then there's you know probably double that. Um, and then there's some organisations, for example, and we're being very careful not to speak about specific organisations because we think it's not necessarily about 
that pool. It's about um, how they are financially, um, uh, their financial capacity. Mm -hmm. So, but there's an organisation that is getting uh, nearly over nine thousand dollars in rebates um, in, in part of that discretionary component. So we'd just like to have a discussion with council and happy to provide any further information. Well, maybe an oversight on my part, but those of us that are involved with these community halls and the like, do yep. we, are we able to make a decision on that? Do we have to declare a conflict of interest on that? Or? So we'll take some guidance, but that's why we're not talking about specifics. Yeah. So the category uh, or the entity yeah. is, you're not making the necessary decision on, I'll call yeah. Sedan Hall. Um, what you're looking at is criteria. Um, you know, so um, Vanessa, given that we're not speaking about specifics, I don't think there's a necessary. Obviously, it's up to the council member to make that decision. I don't think you need to declare anything because we're not. You're not making a decision specifically on Blanche Town District Hall, yeah. and you're a member of it. Councillor Schultz, if we use your your um, like designation of two hundred fifty thousand, you know, what? How many would be? How many organisations would be in the top bracket? Um, and again, it's about clar clarifying whether it's profit or revenue, mm -hmm. but let's say it's revenue, um, so income that they generate. Um, though out of the, I don't know how the number, Clark, can you count how many is actually in that list? Uh, there's four that would be over um, five, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, five over $200,000. Um, then there would be, one, two, uh, maybe three in between 100 and 200, and the vast majority would be lower that. And some of them under that 100, or whatever the figure is, some of them are between zero and 10,000, some are between 10 and 20, and 20 and 30. So, um, but as Mayor Bailey pointed out, when we have a conversation around this, you do need to consider profit because just because you're generating $30,000 out of meals, and your costs are twenty nine thousand five hundred. Then, yeah. Well, um, how many is the total? Uh, total amount of properties. Um, While they're working that out, my thoughts are seventy five percent rebate is very generous, and I think we do need to look at that other twenty five percent. Um, like I suggested to Ben. Look, just looking at revenue is a little bit dangerous because if you look at council revenue, you know, the state government wouldn't give us any extra if they say you've got plenty of revenue. For me, it's about the profit, the surplus, yeah. um, you know, council. This council's had nine out of ten years deficit. So it would you'd look at it differently if it was that. Um, when I have been, you all know that I've been comparing council rates with many, many councils. So I've seen lots of these um, rate rebates as I've been going through all their, of their agendas and minutes. And many, many councils are not providing that extra rebate of that 25%. You know, so you, we are potentially unsustainable. We do have to look at doing things differently. Um, but if we don't have, if I think we've got revenue figures, but not profit figures. Well, uh, in, look, we've got different figures from different people. So, um, Clive, can you just give a maybe a category of the information we got um, at yeah. part of the discussion? Yeah, so just to chair, um, it, it was reasonably hard to get um, information. Um, in the first instance, I tried to make it very, very simple and to, to advise and just advise, you know, um, how much uh, income was received by a uh, lease or rental, because that was more like um, uh, more like commercial type of uh, um, income, and then also what the balance of the income was. Um, um, a lot of people couldn't even provide that information. So in the second round, I said, could you just give me the latest um, uh, financials. financials or um, uh, that being uh, established and um, put to the committees? So that was a little bit easier. I'm still waiting probably on, and I must admit, um, they're very small organisations, probably about another half dozen. So after two attempts, I've yet to um, get information from the last you know, five or six there. And look, you know, some of the response are, you know, there's not very high turnover. You know, one of them I can remember was um, their total income for the year was 355 because of barbecue. Keeping in mind that um, a lot of these organisations may have been affected by the flood too, so they weren't fully operational as well. 
but like the one which was above Q350, I don't think they're going to be $100,000 in mm. the next year. Yeah. <laughs> the other things we asked about how many um, uh, residents or ratepayers or community members from Mid Murray mm -hmm. was involved in the um, entity uh, or the service that the entity was providing, um, financial grants from other organisations, whether that was federal or state funding that they received. Um, but so the last amount uh, of community grants that we actually received from the council. So um, there was a there was a few of those as well. But again, and, and they were a lot were the, the lower ones as well. So yeah. So we try to con consider what's the best criteria criteria to assess, and you know we wanted to be mostly objective rather than subjective. Um, and it was challenging. Uh, so one of the the ideas we've come up with is. Revenue slash turnover slash profit as a consideration. Um, but yes, is there any other comments, questions, feedback? Obviously, council can decide that they give 100% rebate. Sorry, I should say 100% of the available discretionary rebate. I don't want to confuse people there um, because some are 100%, some are 25%. I think that the idea of through the that the idea of looking at what people can afford is fair and equitable. You know, I think that's the way to go. So you, I mean, it looks like you're coming up with some kind of a model mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. help decide those things, and I think that's the obvious way to go. And I think it's fair enough for people to be asked to provide their physician. Uh, you know, of course, I think that's a, a fair thing to do. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'll just. Just thought of one comparison, uh, just with the. I know you can just quote the top of your head, but if you were talking of, um, say, uh, organisations earning between 200,000 and 100,000 getting a set amount of rebate, um, well, we have rate payers in that same bracket that have to pay their full rates. So uh, if it's I'm just thinking that if it's an organisation that is turning over that amount of money, um, should they get a big discount on on their on their um, discretionary rates? Yeah, and I'll give you it's a fair question, Councillor Barber. Um, so what we're we're talking around is these organisations that have turnover of 487,000, 129,000, 120, 230, 375, 250. Uh, they're the ones probably above that 100,000 threshold. Outside, some of them are sporting clubs, some of them are different types of entities. Um, again, they may not be profit. So none of them, they're all not for profit. Um, so they would reinvest those funds back into the services they're providing. Um, our consideration is that they do have revenue they're generating that is uh, capacity um, much more higher than the hall that made $317 from their barbecue they ran for their... <laughs> but there's community groups that are, and then there's non-for-profit yeah. organisations and the leap between a community group that still is not-for-profit but isn't yet even a non-for-profit entity that's, say, like, you know, a little club that's just got 10 members and a barbecue that they probably haven't gotten organised even to be considered maybe, a you know, like a registered non-for-profit. I don't know if this is... They're all... Uh, they're all registered right. non-for-profits? Okay. Yeah. Well, then sure. Okay. Um, but yeah, community group versus like a larger organisation, yeah, that definitely has still a non-for-profit but has a capacity to run their business, you know, everywhere else. I mean, I guess there's a reason that some of it's discretionary. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, mm. yeah, definitely. And it would be good to start using some discretion. Yeah. 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 And the council needs to consider a fallout as well of any decisions that are made because generally what will happen, uh, one of these entities, if there's a decision to um, not provide them their discretionary rebate, that they'll come back and um, raise their concerns. We should um, have some great communication in regards to that as to why we're doing it as well. Like, I mean, I think most people in our region are now very aware of our financial situation. Mm -hmm. So I think with the telling of the, you know, updated changes if we do go down that path, it's just really just with the no to say, you know, you've been receiving discretionary rebates for how many years? And, you know, at the moment, council can't afford to continue that discretionary rebate for our own financial sustainability practices. Mm -hmm. I think if you explain that to most community organisations, they would get it and they could be like, oh, I've been getting discretionary rebates for 20 years or however long it's been. We let them know how many years we've been offering that extra mm -hmm. rebate 
And I think that'll be, make them be a bit more understanding the dollar value that we've already given to help them and support them as a group um, that we didn't have to, obviously. Um, um, so whether we can have just cons. another five minutes, yeah. if that's... Everyone yeah, have to just yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. for another five minutes. Um, yeah, it probably would have been a good idea if we had um, discussed this before today's meeting because um, those sort of business type groups would have already set their budget for the coming year. So yeah. if they would have had, if they could have got warning, the backlash might not be as. Yeah, that's a very fair point. Um, uh, we had planned to do it earlier, but it was hard to get the information. So I think we provided a report in May from memory um, to council, yeah. and that was the plan to actually mm. make some decisions or have those conversations then. But the information wasn't there. We went out again, and we still tried to. It's a fair fair point. Um, from but they have all had a letter yeah. basically yeah. discussing that we're getting this data to determine. And the so communication was that there was no guarantees moving forward. Yes, right. um, yeah. And it is discretionary. They have to apply every year. Mm -hmm. um, the timing could potentially have an impact. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a fair. Um, also, we do make the decision today on rate rebates, and so um, it's why it's come to council today. I think that um, in general, when you take away something that people have had, we will we'll get some backlash, but, you know, or some commentary around it. But each year we we give that as a hundred percent rebate. We don't get the thanks. Yes. We, we appreciate <laughs> this. You know what it actually means to us. So. You know, I mean, and um, they don't have to because it just. I, gets I can say though, the very small community halls where it is the minute rate, many that I've been to do thank do, counts yeah, for that. Yeah, you know, yeah. but the the large ones. So the I large ones. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> if given our situation, given our ESCO <clears throat> report and and all sorts of things, uh, I think that we need to make some decisions and and actually, yeah, pull out of some some of those things that we don't have to do mm. and and. Show good business sense. Well, the community groups that I'm uh, involved with and also the meetings that I attend when all this was coming out, where they were, what their letters, and I was having to explain to them what was behind it all. Some of them were actually, oh, yeah, fair enough. Mm. Yeah. But there was one or two who were like, oh, no, that's not right. But, but there were some that were like, yeah, well, we yeah. don't understand that. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be, a, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the other element that we would propose is, is that on request they can have the decision reviewed um, as well because um, it will be you know, if I'm looking at some will be potentially up to nine thousand, two thousand, nearly three thousand, twelve thousand, um, or sorry, no, the twelve thousand one is just because of capital value, but their turnover is low. Um, Seven thousand dollars for a community club, um, sporting club, um, because of the valuation of their property. So. Um, but please, it's up to council's decision or discretion. We've just proposed a potential framework. So if you have other ideas how we can assess it in a more subjective way, uh, objective way than subjective, then please um, let us know. I think if you propose the framework and they can review this year, I guess we'll get a really good idea of what we want to propose next year. I would like to see the those figures. people that have got bins be paying for their bins if they've got, you know, more than just the one, because I do know an organisation that has 16 mm -hmm. bins that only pays for one bin, and I think, you know, mm -hmm. otherwise the general public are paying for that and they're already struggling. Yeah. 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 So what, well, we might finish there because mm -hmm. we've got a draft motion which you need to plug into some figures. So what we're proposing, potentially an upper limit, Clive, of a figure, um, then there could be a middle figure where there's half of the potential rebate provided and then uh, under the lower threshold, 100% of whatever the discretionary rate is. But that's up to council's discretion. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. that man, yeah. So back into the meeting now, here is the proposal. So the motion that I read out, subject to applications being assessed in accordance with the following conditions, entities with an annual turnover greater than X amount will not receive discretionary rebates. Entities with an annual turnover between 
X and X will receive 50%. Entities with an annual turnover less than X will receive the maximum discretionary. The entity must provide material benefit or service to the local community and entities are eligible to have their application determination reviewed. So the word figures in. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Chair, can we just change the last dot, dot point, Carol, to just entities are, are able to request uh, instead of eligible, are yes. able to request. Yes. Thank you so much. And the only question, other question on that last dot point is whether you put a time frame on that, mm -hmm. you gave them six weeks, one month, three months, mm -hmm. five. Uh, well, if you did this, would you want a time frame on that for it? Um, probably just because of the nature of instalments, um, I suppose, um, and uh, probably just keeping in consideration that we probably, uh, when we send notices out for instalments, uh, you normally at least have 30 days for payment. So um, whether 30 days would be appropriate. Yeah. yeah. So, so if this request must be... Within... 30 days of notification. Now, I, I suppose I'll just um, add that um, whether then that may involve um, the application going to cancel in a slightly longer period of time it would have to be allowed. Yeah, but the request will be made by 30 days. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter how long it takes. To and that'll be up to determine whether that's reviewed mm -hmm. or it comes okay. to council. Yeah. Or within 30 days or a week before the first instalment is due or something like that. Oh, uh, no, I think I think you just have a period of time. Yeah. Mm. Um, just on the time frame there, not all community groups. Uh, have monthly meetings, oh, some yeah. have bi-monthly meetings. Yeah. So if it's something that needs to come to a meeting, then they may miss that 30-day window. Yeah. Point um, the, the secretary could just write in and say, hey, I would like to request this we be going to a meeting. I, I don't think there would have to be the requirement of the going committee to, to yeah. have a motion and be limited. Mm -hmm. I think it could be one of the chairs could action that mm -hmm. and put forward their their arguments or their points of why they require a higher percentage yeah. or higher amount of, of the discretionary remake. It's, it's not like when we ask for a community loan, we say, oh, there must be a motion by the committee to, for, um, to say that they want to borrow that community loan. From the council. Yeah. So through the chair, it would be a good process for them to have a committee. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, a committee discussion around it. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So logis logistics is thirty days is probably for them to request is ideal. Um, if it was six weeks, Clive, would that? And um, I suppose what we would do on on receiving the application, we could then um, flag the property not to raise any interest or fines. Mm -hmm. That would probably be the um, the situation that we would follow, um, and then if it um, uh, so, then if it went over, so you could actually have it for a longer period of time if you wanted to. But um, yeah, council, uh, in, as far as rates concerned, we would actually say put a flag so there's no interest in fines because there's there's an application in in process basically for consideration that they mightn't have to pay that amount or part of that amount. And just, just for clarity, all these organisations receive a non-discretionary rebate anyway. So they we're just talking, there is a component that's non-discretionary. No. Yeah, and then we're talking about the difference. The, the, no, no, no. So, some, some. Right? so probably out of approximately 42 properties, there's probably, there's probably six properties that receive 75% mandatory and then we'll give them at presently or have in the past given them 25% of their rates and the and the balance, 30 odd, nearly 40, we give them 100% discretionary. Yeah. They so, don't get, just so they don't get any mandatory rebate. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. 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 So uh, your whole like get up to 100% discretionary. Okay. Previously, we've been providing 100%. Yeah. Okay. Now we're having a conversation with some entities that might not. So, yeah, it's fun to be.
do do we need to add in there about the um the bin? Well, it's just sort of with the comment not to do with latitude. Not, with not right. going to. That'd be a good point. We need yeah. to mm -hmm. consider that. With the bin situation, I'm confused. I feel like that is separate to the rates or whatever you pay the bin service fee that we've already just motioned on. Um, so it feels interesting that that has come to a situation where someone would have 16 bins as a community group um, that aren't all registered because that's not even really related to our rates. That's a service that is being provided. That they're how how did that happen? And look, just history. Um, it might have been a property, Dave. If you want to come, we need to we keep you in our microphones. We're not doing that. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Uh, through the chair, yeah, historically, um, uh, as, as community groups grow, uh, grew, they were just asked for different things because it was always dealt with in the rates. <clears throat> now it's a service charge. Oh, so there's a, there's, a, there's a different parameter mm -hmm. that's applied. So the cleansing of the uh, audit process, which we did a couple of months ago, mm -hmm. sort of gave a bit of a, a rise to how, how many of those were actually uh, using foreign bins as well. Mm -hmm. So that came as a bit of a cleansing process. Yeah, okay. So there's still a bit of work to do. Got it. <laughs> Yeah, so, so discretionary rebates, as far as the legislation is concerned, is, is solely about um, the general rates that yeah, are raised. Yeah, sure. So they can't have two mm, different... They should be paying yeah. them. So generate, and then you have these service charges, like mm. bins, mm. like your TV, and all that other stuff, yeah. yeah. All right. So Can there's a... plug some figures in there? Oh, that's up to council. <laughs> <laughs> Does someone want to move that? Uh, motion and plug some figures in there. And before you do that, you don't have to have every layer. So you don't have to have like above 100 and then 50% mm -hmm. for that. It could mm -hmm. be just a figure and they get 100%. Um, they're just examples for your consideration. Mm -hmm. Being that the last line allows you to review it, do we need lots or just over 100 then? What was the well, the community groups that I'm aware of uh, majority of them wouldn't have 50,000 too, they mm -hmm. have a majority yeah. of them. Yeah. So you really, you're really suggesting that we're really going into a sort of a semi business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. An income earning not for profit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Over 100,000. Yeah, I think greater than 100,000 definitely would be a good starting point at the top. Who's moving it? You're moving it? I'll move it. Yeah. I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> So Councillor Barber is moving and Councillor Hammond is seconding that subject to applications being assessed in accordance with the following conditions, entities with an annual turnover greater than 100,000 will not receive any discretionary rebate. And do you want the middle? Can I just ask another question? Mm -hmm. Those people who do not provide the information you need to make that judgment well, they haven't applied for a rebate then. Mm. Yeah. Yes. So each application have to yes. um, apply. So they have to it. provide the information, or they're not. And in the in the interviews. letter that went out said, so if you don't provide this, there is a chance that you or may or will, come with the exact wording, and not receive your rebate. So yeah. ah, we'll do that. Okay. Um, just so your awareness, if it was a, if it was a hundred grand, um, there's probably one, two, uh, one, two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight organisations, um, and in some examples, that would be up to seven thousand um, dollars for our sporting club. That um, they won't get because of the capital value of their organisation of their property. Mm -hmm. Just so you're aware, mm -hmm. but that, that that's a total we're looking at seven thousand. Yeah, total. If they receive done. Yeah, so um, individually uh, above there, like the highest one I can see was 3,700. That's totally a little. Oh, that's 25%. Uh, yep, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, if we talk about some type of, like, as, as far as a recreational sport, the, the highest rebate in previous financial year was 3,700. Yeah. yeah. But if you have a hundred thousand in like the bank, that's not actually that. They might not have it in the bank. That's not the bank. That's not the bank. They don't have this capital. Mm. So, and then previously we talked about 
there were some other figures talked about um, as far as like 250,000 as well. So whether that is a better figure or not, it's up to, up to council. I'm just well, just to that previous that discussion. Right, yeah. I, I yeah. wouldn't. I would back you up on that. I think there needs to be a couple level. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One is yeah. a bit. Yeah. So, Councillor, I would thinking about that. Do you want the top one to be say two hundred and fifty, and then that middle one where we can give a fifty percent of the maximum yeah. rebate, so that that three thousand will turn into fifteen hundred. I still think two hundred fifty is really high. Yeah, I was thinking rather like fifty two hundred, because I mean if you're if you're turning over two hundred thousand yeah. dollars and you're Possible rebate is three and a half thousand. Talking about one and a half, two percent, three percent, which is which is not all. Right, you're the mover. What do you want? Yeah, to plug in there. <laughs> well, well, plug in the plug in two hundred for the top one. Sorry, I should be better terminology. <laughs> um, I would say. Maybe eighty thousand. The second one. So between eighty and two hundred and forty nine 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 nine. Yeah. One nine one nine nine nine. Sorry, I was going to one nine 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 nine. And then less than eighty thousand. Yeah. It's only, only by testing it that we'll know yeah, whether, yeah, this, is yeah. whether yeah. this is fair. Yes. I, I was I was actually thinking of 50 for the bottom one, but then that's not the one. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, look, um, um, whenever introducing anything um, new, mm. it's yeah. kind of a little bit better to kind of um, not be as tight. You know, mm. you say, well, yeah, we can review it, we can mm. see what the effect of that can be yeah. so yeah you know, I I would feel personally better having the the higher figures there yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that government's man is having connections around the, the move and the second oh. the second oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I honestly feel that with that top figure like if they like I said if they if they've got a turnover of two hundred thousand or more. I personally don't feel it should be much of an issue because you talk to like we want two percent of the turnover. Yep. So, so we'll just go clarify the seconder and I think Council yep. Council wants to talk the seconder happy with that. Yes, I'm happy with that. Mm -hmm. Speaking on behalf of the Morgan RSL, we're very grateful for the rebate that we get. Our turnover at this stage is about twenty thousand dollars a year, and we're struggling. Yeah. So we do appreciate that rebate, but yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I think it makes it fair for those smaller organisations that don't have the same kind of turnover or the same kind of public exposure as say a bigger organisation has, because they are the ones that probably really are deserving of those discretionary rebates, you know, big time. And you got other organisations that have capacity, and they should. And that's Carry the way of just keeping it with numbers because then hopefully yeah get in there. But like I said, when people when the, I talk to the government, I'll, you know, just so we bring thirty million dollars and I still need some help mm -hmm. and some support. So I think it's great that we've got that last line in there to say that hey, we can still look at it yeah. Yeah. and review. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, any further discussion on that item? Any further questions? Mm -hmm. Moves are in second. Are happy? We'll put yep. that one up. All those in favour? And against that is carried. Mm -hmm. That was like mm -hmm. a good discussion to have, yeah. and that's yeah. why we wanted Important. to. Yeah. Uh, rates, a uh, rebate of rates, general carve, and that's another long one. So just uh, we're limiting a twenty percent increase in general rates to eligible rate payers. Uh, rate payers eligible for the rate capping with their general rates, excluding swims and all of those other things, our increase more than 20%. Have we got a mover for that? Councillor Hammond and seconder, Councillor Barber. Do you have any questions or discussion on that? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. Recommendation, rebate of rates, primary production. Um, 
See under section 159 at 3 and 166 1A and B of the Local Government Act in respect to the financial year ending 30 June 2025, a rebate of rates shall be given to principal rate payer who makes a written application to council for a rebate and satisfies the council that the rebate is desirable for the purposes, purpose of securing proper development of the area for the purpose of assisting and supporting a business in the area provided that the relevant rateable land does not receive an adjustment as a single farm enterprise. The rateable land is used for the primary purpose, for the purpose of the primary production and the land is used in conjunction with other land also being used for primary production. And the amount of rebate shall be the difference between the minimum amount payable by way of general rates and the total amount payable by way of general rates in respect of land or the sum of $190 whichever is the lesser amount. Have we got a Councillor Hammond and a seconder. Councillor Sotchin repeat. Any discussion on that, Councillor Schultz? Um, the amount of $190, that was just, that's the same as last year, yeah? Correct. Right. So just, just through the chair, the situation is mainly only to do with, I think, only two or three properties. It's where you have a farmer and their... Spread out. They, they lapse over more than one council. So basically, if they're all one council, we would treat them as single farming enterprise. What we're saying is if they've got land over another council, we'll still treat them as single farming enterprise. So the minimum rate wouldn't be applicable. Or, or sorry, the rebate to that amount. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, because that would be confusing for me. Yeah. Now I understand. Yeah. Any further questions? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour? And against that is Harry. <coughs> Recommendation rebate of rates, Quira Community Wastewater Management System Capital Contribution, um, pursuant to in accordance with section 166 1A of the Local Government Act, Council being of the opinion that it's desirable to do so for the year ending 30 June 2025 for the purpose of securing proper development of the following parts of the council's area that a rebate of $461 of the annual service charge shall be given to the principal rate pay in respect to each property, which has been provided with a connection point for the Quira Community Wastewater Management System, who have paid to council their share of the capital cost to install the system. And Councillor Hammond is using that one. We have a seconder. Councillor Barber, thank you. Any questions, discussion on that? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour? Against? That is carried. Payment of rates. The rates for financial year ending 30 June 2025 are payable for quarterly instalments on the 6th day of September 2024, December 2024, June 2025, and on the 7th day of March 2025. Do we have a mover? Councillor Hammond and Councillor Touching McPeak. Any questions, discussion? Councillor Touching McPeak. Did we have some feedback during the consultations at some point about people wanting to pay more frequently, to have the option to pay, you know, to spread it out? So, so just for the chair, um, council can, uh, a rate payer can pay um, through a range of direct debit. But yeah, so we have people that um, make weekly payments and they, they're directly debited from their account. We have people that have uh, pay on fortnightly basis based on their from directly from their Centrelink money that comes right through us. So they don't, uh, it doesn't come to them and then um, then they pay us. It comes directly out to like the deduction so would be like your pay packet, like a deduction coming out. And um, so, so there's various different ways of having um, payment plans uh, made. And, and also if you want to have direct debit uh, for your instalments, you can also register. So then council will actually debit the amount of the quarterly instalment um, when it's due. Yeah. Don't have to join that. Lots of options. Correct. I think there was a suggestion of um, a discount if somebody pays up front. Mm -hmm. That might have been in that consultation. Yeah, yeah. I think I remember that too. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, just for, for the chair, so the uh, calculation has got to be. Um, uh, performed between um, the amount of money, uh, the rate of money that council was actually um, uh, receiving, I suppose, as an investment versus the period of time for each instalment. So um, basically the money that um, would be, um, so 
um, discount is, is given on if pay, payment is made 100% on the first instalment date. So basically the first quarter, council's not getting any, any advantage on that, so we can't give them a discount on that. The second one would be, um, so we're receiving a quarter of the, the money um, three months in advance, and then next quarter, six months, and next quarter, nine months, and then you perform a calculation. I did do a, um, a calculation previously, and it would be less than 1% that we'd be able to afford to give it, because it's got to be, so it's calculated between a win-win situation on both parties, so <coughs> both parties get, get it. Um, the issue that I've had in many other councils is people pay late, and they deduct the money. They deduct the, the interest. Mm -hmm. So they might pay 100%, but they pay three or four a week later, and then I'm chasing them mm -hmm. for a, you know, because of the discount of like $15. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, my rate officer and I are talking to them because what will happen is they won't want to talk to, or they want to talk to the rate officer then they'll say no i want to talk to someone dearer uh, like uh, next, you know, next like person up, and then they'll want to come to me and then the situation they might even want to talk to the ceo mm -hmm. so you yeah you know, you've got this you know that, it there starts, has been issues you know i'm mm -hmm. quite I'm quite it's, it's quite good where people do do it but mm -hmm. what you do is then you print on the rate, rate notice you say if you're paying 100 by a certain date you can deduct this amount and unfortunately people don't pay by that date but still that, that, yeah. That's probably the, the <laughs> biggest um, issue with it, mm. and it is a, I'll keep it nice, administration nightmare, I'll call it. Yeah. Some issue with the is it's uh, not as easy as just doing a discount. Um, so yeah, I think there's some challenges. I'm wondering if we can have a briefing on that before next rate right period, and yeah, at least we've yeah. had a good discussion on it, maybe comparing it with other councils, um, mm -hmm. what they do, because uh, someone did put it out there. Mm. Yes. Look into it. So, so with the previous council, I did give a presentation, mm -hmm. but I'll give one to this council as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, any further questions on the date of payment of rates? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour? And again, that uh, is carried. Uh, rating policy. The council's reviewed rating policy be endorsed. We've got a mover, Councillor Schultz and Councillor Hammond. Would you like to speak on that? No, no one. Uh, any questions or discussion with that rating policy? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. And is that last of that? <laughs> Thank you very much, Clive, for all the work you've done in rates. I know we've given you quite a hard time. Um, I said to a member of the public on Saturday who came up to me and said, how are you feeling about council's financial situation? I said, look, I've been involved in council for eight years now and this long-term financial plan and new business plan is the most comfortable I've felt in the whole of the eight years that I've uh, known council. So thank you very much for helping me sleep at night. <laughs> it's, it's been enjoyable for the seven workshops that we've held. <laughs> <laughs> Not that you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Next year there'll be eight. Clive, your nose is growing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well informed. Hey, Clive, can't say, given it's uh, 10.43, that finance never gets, you know, yeah. any time on the council agenda. Uh, infrastructure yeah. and field services report. And the report, the recommendation is that the report be received. And Councillor Hammond is moving it and Councillor Farber is seconding it. I just want to make sure everyone did get the attachment mm. that was sent out yesterday by Carol with the actual report. Do we have any questions? I said one. In regards to um, the mains power access at Marianne Reserve with the houseboat moorings, I was down there the other day because I do have a friend who has a houseboat that I was having a little hello on. Um, and apparently there is actually already a, like an electrical station thing that has been placed there ages ago for the intention of like for the houseboats to be hooked into. And he pointed to me, he goes, that's what that is. And it was like this big box that he said was put in ages ago. And he goes, I don't know if anything's happened about it. So I was just wondering, and I'm obviously looking at ways that they can charge in and that it's the user pay and all of that. But are you aware that, that the power is there for the process already? Or I wasn't sure if it wasn't really spoken here, but. 
uh, through the mayor, um, yeah, we do actually have quite a few power boxes down in the area in reserve, mm. which the when there's an event down there, they do access. And there's actually also some meters down there which go across the wharf to power the boats, and the boats actually pay for those, uh, the power supply of those. Oh. Um, so there is actually no metered <coughs> individual areas that would go to a, uh, a direct to a houseboat. Um, <clears throat> and I have had a response from the boating industry in Australia saying that um, there are similar areas in Murray Bridge which uh, are non-charged, to my belief. Um, and, but it's some work on what we need to do. But mm. it was raised when we looked at uh, the master plan for Marion Reserve, and it didn't get a lot of support. Mm. Uh, and also, I suppose, <clears throat> from the houseboat's point of view, um, they do use generators, but now solar activities and solar charging is so much more, mm. uh, I suppose, viable to some mm. of the houseboats. So whether it's commercial, uh, commercially viable is another reason. I think the yeah. thing a little bit with it, I'll just say as well, is that, you know, you'll have, like, say, unforgettables or, like, business structure commercial houseboats that are definitely... Um, more inclined to be going on that solar route. But when you see some of these old little cute houseboats that people live on where they still do have the generator and they're going at night quite loudly for the nearby beautiful person on their commercial experience at Marianne Reserve on a very quiet vessel, I can see how that would be very annoying to them. And I've even been down there at night and heard all the other generators of the little kind of like, you know, cute but very ancient houseboats that are put, put, putting along. Um, they can create quite a loud noise disturbance down there at night. I've been down there and heard the loud drone of it all. So I can see how for someone who's holidaying at Marianne Reserve, that would be annoying. <laughs> Are we a uh, commercial no, caravan no, no, boats? And we don't no. provide it in any of our reserves, but caravans, yeah. I'm just saying we should steer clear of anything that's extra money that... Mm, I've got to spend any money. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, any further questions? Yes, Councillor. I'll just have a comment. There'll be plenty of happy people up at the Cape, up in the Cape area when mm -hmm. that section arrives, it's still... Yes, mm. they will be excited about that. Lots of things happening. Any further questions or discussion? And again, Dave, very good report. It's so good seeing the green mm. bits, I can mm. tell you. <laughs> uh, no further discussion. We'll put that motion up. All those in favour? And <coughs> thanks. That is carried. Um, 10.2, Infrastructure Agreement Amendment, Palmer Wind Farm Development, and the recommendation is that the report be received. We have a mover. Uh, Councillor Hammond and Councillor Davis, thank you. Any questions or discussion on that? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour? And again, so that is carried. 10.3, Infrastructure Agreement Amendment, Walker Avenue Manham Development Plan, and the recommendation is that report be received. Councillor McGregor is moving and Councillor Schultz, thank you, is seconding. Do we have any questions, Councillor McGregor? Yeah, um, oh, just through the mayor. I did see the um, email through, just sort of the, um, uh, what does that, what does it actually mean for council? I know we sort of, we don't have the funding for the stormwater um, program at the moment, but um, is there other funding that we're going to be able to tap into? And will it, does it tie our hands when they're starting to develop that? Um, that they're going to say, well, you have to sort of pay it now. Good chair. Um, <clears throat> basically, your hands are tied anyway because we are looking at external water to the site, and trying to deal with uh, external water plus their internal water. So it's basically a joint exercise trying to deal with the, all the stormwater in that area. Um, there was, I think from memory, it was about a $2.1 million project, where it was about $1 million for them, to uh, $1.1 for us. Um, it is unfunded. Uh, we are exploring avenues for funding and whether that can be funded and whether this is uh, turns out to be a submission. That's what we're working on now. And there is a funding stream now, which uh, we spoke about yesterday, S&T, which we'll start exploring. So through the about it, we're committed to it because we signed a deed. Um, council agreed to it, and so we will look at opportunities. Uh, I think we applied in the past day for another um, stormwater grant as well, which we were unsuccessful for. Storm management authority. We're very, very mindful that this is something that we would love external funding on, and so the housing support su program, support program, which we've been successful just recently. So we'll be putting a submission in that, and the stormwater will form part of that. Absolutely. Very lucky that there's a big push on housing at the moment. Yes. So yeah. hopefully we will uh, get that again and we will be letting government know how grateful we are for any funds that we received <laughs> in that. <laughs> any further questions on that item? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour? 
and again, that is carried. Oh, goodness. Uh, 10.4 marks landing bridge Swan Reach. The recommendation is that the report be received. Councillor Hammond is moving that one, and Councillor Tuchik McPick is seconding that. Do we have any questions? Oh, yeah, Councillor Barr? Oh, so <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my question was uh, regarding the previous flight limit before the flood. Um, how did the um, what was the issue with the heavy vehicles going through prior? Because I'm sure there would have been at some point time heavy vehicles going through, but structure was happening previously. Through the chair, um, I suppose the uh, his, history historically, it's always been a 12 ton load limit. Uh, because of the issues that we've found with trying to get a 12 ton truck across there, when we introduced um, a lot of the uh, rural pickup, the uh, township pickup, our truck, our solo truck could have potentially been over 12 ton. So we did a test on it. Um, we then went and got uh, the, an engineering assessment. Because it's such a short span, the 12 ton limit doesn't really, uh, I suppose, apply to the full axle weights on it at any one time. And, and the, uh, hence the sign sort of highlights the actual weights that can cross it at any time there's weight on that bridge. So it's been evaluated that in theory, a semi-trailer uh, under general mass limits could, could cross that bridge if it was three-quarter loaded as a guide. Um, so every axle weight would be three-quarters, nearly three-quarters of the weight um, to get across that bridge. So what we've been doing is allowing the permit to, so they can actually go over that bridge at those axle weights based on the, 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 the structural assessment we've got. Um, yes, there would be uh, people that would cross with a, a fully loaded vehicle and that would come back to a safe old matter because all we can do is highlight that what the um, uh, weights on the door are to the truck. We can't assess what the weight of that vehicle is when it crosses that bridge. So it becomes a safe old matter or an HVR matter. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, any further questions on that? If not, I'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, carry. 11.1 Sport and Recreation Facilities Review for Community Leases, Licences and Management Agreements. The recommendation is that the report be received. We have a mover, Councillor Barber, Councillor McGregor. Would anyone like to speak on that? Yes. Uh, hang on, we'll go, go Councillor Barber, then Councillor McGregor, then Councillor Hammond. Oh. Uh, yeah, I've got um, one question uh, through the chair. Uh, how have so many of these leases been allowed to remain expired for so long? I noticed some of them are like 10 years plus. And I just think it's incredible that that's actually happened. And just uh, as a statement, I noticed on one thing, uh, I'm not aware that the Pernod Noble well, actually has a tennis court. It's got some overgrown bitumen. And you know, that's supposed to be a tennis court, I'm not sure, but I don't think it's actually a tennis court as such. So my question was about the <laughs> lease being expired. So well, I thought you were looking at the other end of the table. <laughs> well, I was, but where was the answer? Look, it's a fair point, um, Councillor Barber. Um, obviously, comes back to resourcing and priorities of previous um, councils and administrations. So we've got a process in place. We're trying to work through each one. Uh, for example, I know that we're working through on through three or four at the moment, and we'll continue to do that um, to try to make sure that we've got everything in place. So. Um, through the mayor. Um, so when I um, and thanks for this report because it is one that I sort of did ask for when we're talking about the football lighting. Um, there are a lot of inconsistencies in it, and I understand it's that there's quite complexities. Um, I, I'm more to, I'm just wondering whether we could maybe have a briefing on this, um, just to understand you know some groups who've got maintenance agreements to so get money paid for them the some there's some things in the lease agreements that i think are probably incorrect or and that so it's just like a little bit of a discussion as to how we can make this minefield 
um, where we're not comparing apples and bananas and grapes and an avocado and a carrot thrown in and actually have a really consistent sort of model. So, um, yeah, if we could have a briefing on that would be really good. Thank you. And I think our new policy will, that's out for consultation now, will sort of hopefully get some of those things uh, in better form. Mm -hmm. Council Hallamy. Yes, I'd agree and like a briefing. Um, just because things I was interested about was how some we pay for the insurance and others they pay for their own insurance and all of that. I was like, where did we make that deciding factor of when we pay insurance and when we allow them to look after that themselves? I also just want to alert you to an error that's been made on page 218 um, when we're talking about the Manham Football Club, the Manham Oval Complex for the football in the permitted use of land. It's obviously just been grabbed from when you did it for the cricket club um, in the proper manner, the cricket club, including hosting games and conducting practices and training sessions. They're not obviously running a cricket club, they're running a footy club, so I just think that little, little thing there in the report should be amended. Um, I think we did so glad yeah. I did, oh, I didn't say, oh, it's all, okay, but you did amend that already. Well, well good for you, thank you, and I mean, obviously. Sorry, sent an email to the elected Oh, I can send an email because I had some problems. Um, yes. Okay, good times. Um, my one other question, I guess, was also um, in regards to the lights, how some we've got listed and others we maybe don't list, it would be possible for us to actually see maybe a light audit of all the complexes that we do own the light facilities on those land spaces. Just after what happened at the Manor Mobile, obviously I want to make sure all of our other lights are properly being depreciated or considered as assets if they are, if they've been turned off, why and when, and if we have any plans to reinstate them and all of that. Just if that could be provided to us at some stage with maybe a briefing session, that would be great. Yeah, that's what this report was all about, mm. is highlighting those mm. sorts of assets. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Some of the mentioning were not good. Um, so being that we will put a briefing on the table, any further questions for this item at the moment? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that was carried. Mm -hmm. Sorry, but they really loud. 11.2, reserves, private moorings and river structures mm -hmm. policy. And the recommendation is the report be received. The reserves, private moorings and river structures policy version one be endorsed for public consultation in accordance with Council's public consultation policy and the communication plan. Councillor Hammond is moving that and Councillor Barber is sending that and you would like to speak? I would like to move it with maybe just a slight couple of amendments to the policy. Um, I went in down the deep rabbit hole looking into permits that other council areas provide to us, you know, not, not to their community. Um, one example I looked at was Alexandrina's council and how they do different things of river access or ocean access or moorings and the fees that they charge with it. Obviously, when we create this permit process, I would like it to be including of the CPI increase every year. Even if it is going to be a five-year arrangement that CPI is included in the poll in their permit. Um, but one thing I've noticed in their policy structure that they had was that they said that the money obtained from the permit would then go to improving the facilities along the river frontage. They say that in their in their policy. Something along that lining so people know that when we are putting in this permit, that money is going to also improving us post floods, obviously, restoring boat ramps, doing other things in community areas, fixing things that might be broken. Like it'd be really great if that money could be allocated to a certain, instead of just going straight back into administrative costs for council, that it went to actually improving things along the river corridor for people. I think that would help a lot. Um, with the community consultation process, I would love to see also an audit of our moorings and see exactly how many jetties, moorings, things we have in our region, like an actual an audit of them, which can easily be done by Google images these days of zooming in and seeing where there might be structures coming into the river just so we get an idea of how many we have on the river. Um, and one little amendment I wanted to make to the policy, if I can just go to it quickly, is the, 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 um, hold on, bear with me two seconds when I get to the page. Um, we sort of say about public access and we say how they remind, they remain to be public access areas um, for the enjoyment of people. Um, I think in there we need to be quite specific. The policies are a little bit friendly in the way that I think we should also say that private moorings and private soft property signs being, you know, um, pro prohibited on those structures because I think unless we put it in words, people will still do that. And really, I think we're seeing that people think that those jetties are theirs when really we're trying to say with this policy, 
we're giving you access to space on Crown land, the permit to put the structure there, but you don't own that structure. It becomes, you know, it's an asset on council land or council controlled Crown land. So I think we should have a, a, a policy in there in place to really stop those signs. That's a lot, I know. <laughs> uh, through them there, thank you. Uh, Yes, we did look at the Alexandrina policy very closely when we were developing this. Uh, theirs is very uh, linked to the Crown Lands policy, and we've made that very clear in this policy. It's, ours is also linked to the Crown Lands mm -hmm. policy. We're still yet to meet with Crown Land to uh, talk through some of the uh, elements of this, and through the consultation period we'll be doing that, mm -hmm. because, yeah, we want to make sure that we can align as much of our policy to other councils and state government mm -hmm. in terms of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as doing an audit, yeah, we can we can definitely do that during the consultation and we map back uh, the final policy post-consultation, and we'll guess we'll amend uh, section 449 to include a sub element to that. Or, it was 449, was it? 449, public, public use. use. Yeah, applicants not have exclusive use. And yeah, yeah. The, those signs being excluded. Yes, we can have that before consultation draft. Well, one other question, just one other, sorry. Um, so obviously, we're putting this in for future people's plannings of the waivers or whatever, but for there's no way that we can do it historically for people's existing structures. No, I didn't think so. Well, through the chair, what we'll try to do is, is uh, encourage people who have existing structures. We would, uh, if that, if and when they ever have to upgrade, they'll be captured mm -hmm. through the process. Councillor McGregor. In through the chair. Uh, uh, just a, a question. These structures don't become council's assets, do they? They're not. No. They're, they're, yeah, okay. I just want to make that really clear because. <laughs> That's a, that's a minefield. Mm. Yeah, I'll check the policy. It was happening here. Mm. <laughs> uh, any further discussion, questions? If not, we will put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. And yeah, please encourage public consultation. Mm. And yeah. great job, Gary, on all of that. It's so much easier to follow, and mm. we are getting some really positive comments mm. about our consultation. Mm. Thank you. Well, point one, Chief Executive Officer's monthly report. And the recommendation is that the report be received. Councillor Barber is moving that one. Councillor Davis is seconding that. Do we have any questions, comments? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour, against, that is carried. And I would like to add, to Ben as well, all the extra work you've been doing, many, many late nights, lots of late emails, so none of that's reported in there, so thank you. 12.2, uh, motion action list, and the recommendation is that the report be received, and Councillor McGregor is moving, Councillor Barlow is seconding that one. Do we have any questions, comments, discussion? Councillor Tutchin, I think. Just a... Uh... Just a quick comment that I really like the new format. I think it's very helpful. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> Any further discussion? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, it's carried. Great. Australian Local Government Association 2024 National General Assembly Report and the recommendation is that the report be received. Councillor Barber is moving that one. Councillor Davis is seconding that. Do we have any questions, comments? Councillor Tottenham, what do you think? Sounds exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. And, you know, it looks like it's fantastic that you have the chance to talk to so many people um, and to get some welcome or unwelcome advice at uh, the shadow minister's address where he said local government's naive in the way it manages the politics of government and that we need to get more smart and more understand more the process of lobbying I suppose um, and it was also interesting to note that 
nine out of 10 of Drone Region's fund applications that were deemed eligible were unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. So they used $96 million less and could have been allocated, which is just shocking, mm -hmm. appalling, really. So I'm mm -hmm. very interested to know what kind of rationale they're providing that people deemed eligible as we did after stage one. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still, it's pretty sickening to see they didn't allocate the money mm -hmm. when it's so needed. Yep, that's good for me. Found that totally crazy too, that bill. God. And through you, Mayor Bailey, uh, that, that's a challenge because generally okay. if you go through the EOI process and you're mm -hmm. deemed to be eligible, you feel like you're a reasonable mm -hmm. chance. Yeah. But clearly there was a lot of eligible projects like ours. Um, the feedback we've initially had from the department was that there was uh, other projects that were more... Uh, no, no more uh, fit the criteria uh, more um, closely than us mm -hmm. and a number of different projects. Um, we'll say that we're still trying to have a meeting with the department to make sure we can get some specific feedback, but that's unable, that hasn't happened so far. And to add to that, I've sent many emails to senators and uh, other people in politics letting them know about our disappointment and how much it affects our community. So there's definitely some people on our side that are sort of advocating and lobbying for us. Uh, Definitely was very exhausting, lots of ups and downs. You know, for me, I always like to hear Avity is so those ministers that, or the shadow ministers that told us how it was. I guess it was a bit of an eye opening reflection. I've been to the same conference three times in the last four years, and I see how I go, you know, fighting for this 1%, and it was this time that I went, we're never going to get 1%. We need to go off on a different track, and I'll send you all an email to show you what I've sent off to all of the South Australian mayors and we'll be lobbying quite and I've had some strong support that, you know, maybe we just need to change our agenda and let them we'll keep doing their thing and for South Australia maybe we can fight something else. So, yeah, very awakening, I guess, for me. <laughs> Any further questions or comments? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. 12.5 appointment of suitable persons to act as oh, chief. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we did do that one. 12.4 uh, section 270 review waiver under reserves private mooring policy. And the recommendation is that the report be received that the application, oh, so this, yeah, the application for a waiver under the reserves private moorings policy section 270 review be considered and received. And following recommendations contained in the application for waiver under the reserves uh, private warrants policy section 273 that council decision of 20th of February be affirmed or there's an alternate so council Hammond, what would you like to um move? i would like to move that it's been affirmed because i do feel like we made the right decision and it was proof that it was off to go on that it was obviously a legal decision made at the time based oh god sorry about that Ooh. um yeah, that it was obviously come back. We go through this process when someone does obviously want to go under review. Um, it costs us a fair bit of money to do it, obviously, as well. We're happy to do it, obviously. And it's great to have that, you know, feedback given to them that the lawyers found it to be fine. So I feel like to make an amendment on it now, we are about to review that policy, obviously, but this is before that policy. And I, I feel like we shouldn't be postponing it. Um, I still feel very strongly that if there's a road dividing your property from the river, that um, it's not your private mooring. Um, and I think in the email conversations we saw from it, it felt like that there has been that misunderstanding through real estate agents. I think it's where it happens. Real estate agents, when you buy a property, are like, oh, they said it to me too, even though I'm on a cliff. Down there, that's your little private launch area. You know, it's not my private launch area. That is Crown Land Access that people, not just me, but everyone else in Pondy near me uses that space. It's a community land. So I think having these new policy will definitely help people understand that that land isn't just given to them. Um, and so, yeah, I'm real proud that we did the right thing. Yep. So you're moving one, two, and three. Yep. And we'll delete four. So can I just clarify one thing? Um, the, the review doesn't say the decision is fine. What it says is the process is fine. fine. Council... Council has the ability to make that decision. Mm. So it doesn't make a judgment on no. the actual decision. Mm. Um, so I just thought it was important that I recorded that. Do we have a seconder for that? Yes, Councillor Schultz, would mm. you like to speak? Yeah, yeah. just to follow on on Victoria, uh, Councillor um, Henry's comment. Sorry. Okay. 
um, about the uh, person believing that that might have been their, per you know, their personal structure. Well, when you buy a property, there's that thing, why well, beware of it. And there's a title given to you where you see your actual title and where it ends. Okay, so we've had a speaker or have we got any further speakers or questions? Yes, that's all subject. Um, having uh, voted as we did last time, myself included, I've actually reconsidered and I would prefer to see the other option that we um, approve the application on the basis that, and, and I take responsibility for this, would, we have set so many precedents in the past of letting these things just go through that it feels as if we've been a little bit unfair on this particular individual. And I feel that's because, for me, that was because of my own uh, lack of uh, a, a, a clear whole picture of the whole thing. And I just feel that that was a, a judgment call that I made at the time. Uh, which uh, went totally against what have we been doing until that point. We passed through several of these very similar applications, and I'm assuming that the, the new policy will help address this, and we've also delegated those decisions for the future uh, to the staff as well, which I think is a, an appropriate thing, because they have the knowledge to make those decisions. So on the basis that I felt I didn't have the knowledge to actually go ahead and support that decision last time, I would actually support uh, including the second option, which is to approve the application. So you've spoken against what's been... Approved. Yes. Mm. Yes. Any further discussion? Anyone else want to speak? If not, we'll put that motion up as it is with one, two and three. All those in favour and against? That is carried. Now we go to 12.5, appointment of civil persons to act as chief executive officer. The recommendation is that the report be received and that pursuant to section 102 of the Local Government Act, the following persons be endorsed as suitable persons to be appointed by the CEO to act in the office of CEO during the periods of absence, Director of Corporate Financial Services, Clive Himple, Director of Development and Community Services, Gary Novranek, and Director of Infrastructure and Field Services, Dave Cassett. Have we got a mover? Councillor Davis and Councillor Barber. Do we have any discussion on that? Councillor Touching and Slight side issue. I'd just like to congratulate Gary on being permanent to be being appointed to the position following his um, probationary period. Approved. Been a great addition to the team. We were really worried because we did love great Jake, so you put it in lovely. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Who was that guy? <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions, discussion, feedback? If not. We'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. Declaration, conversion of a private road to a public road, lot 411 Adelaide Road, Manor. And the recommendation is that the report be received, that consent be granted for the purchase of the private road allotment, lot 411 F208786, comprised of the certificate of title volume 6207 folio in the town of Manham for its capital value of $2,500 and for council to pay all requisite costs for the transfer of the land and pursuant to section 210 of the Local Government Act, council declares the private road allotment lot 411 comprised in certificate of title volume 6207 folio in the town of Manham as a public road and that road be named David Street. Do we have a mover? Councillor Barber and Councillor McGregor is seconding that. Question, have a question? Just with the um, capital value of $2,500 on this bit of land, um, that was decided on based on an agreement with the landowner on the value. I just thought such a small piece of land be worth that amount of coin, but, um, you know, I could be wrong. <laughs> <clears throat> no, through the chair, uh, that's the rateable value uh, mm. uh, based by the um, uh, value of general yeah, on, right. on the base notice. Yeah, okay. So that's why we chose uh, $2,500. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Well, 
Mm, it's, down it's a tree. Land has come up. It's a tree. <laughs> it's a tree. <laughs> had a little section of Council road. Of yeah, I was uh, curious as, sorry, through the chair, I was curious as to how this actually happened, mm. like how we ended up building, obviously it was many years ago, but how did council end up building a road through someone's private property? Damien, I'll, 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 we just do it once, we don't care what they are. <laughs> so there's, um, yeah, I'll probably will say that there's, inconsistencies right across the state on where paper roads and roads exist and that may well be because of surveying across the many 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 years so this is not unique that there's issues such as this especially in shack settlements dave i think it's fair to say mm -hmm. um you know an example where the surveying is wrong all across the shack settlement and some people's properties are actually you know a meter or two mm -hmm. across so mm -hmm. It happens. They can't, get, they, they can't even get state border right. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. So, Dave, is there anything else to add on that? Uh, for Chair, I suppose this was a bit of an anomaly for me. Uh, the owner, they actually sold off part of the land in Hall of Dagshaw, thinking they sold this portion of land, and all of a sudden they got a race notice for a portion of land they didn't even know they owned. So that's how it's came, came to be invented mm. to us. And they, they said they were going to build a fence along that area if we didn't resolve it. So we've gone through the process, and it's fair and equitable, we believe it. Yeah, I don't know how many of us will be happy to pay rates on that. <laughs> but, uh, any further questions or discussion? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. 12.7, museum entry passes for Mid Murray residents. Okay, we've got slight amended motion. So the recommendation is that the report be received. The council waive the entry fee as listed in council's register of fees and charges to the Manandoc Discovery Centre or the Morgan Lancier Museum for any mid murray council ratepayer, two adults and two children, on presentation of a relevant voucher. And that council waive the entry fee as listed in council's register of fee and charges to the Manandoc Discovery Centre or the Morgan Lancier Museum for any mid murray council volunteer Two adults, two children on presentation of a relevant voucher. We have a mover for that. Councillor Davis and Councillor Barber is seconding that. Councillor Hallams and then Councillor Schultz. Hey, I think this is a great initiative to help get people in the doors and to help our local community see the value of them and to then be able to promote them better within their friend circle. My only concern about this policy, excluding our rental people in the community that are local residents, I feel like it should be based on a voucher system and certainly ratepayers are always the ones who get the vouchers for things. But I think if there's proof of like an ID <laughs> with your residential address, um, being in Manham in the local area for our low income rental communities to not get that access to be able to do the same is what we're going to allow a rate payer. I think it seems just a little bit unfair. So um, they're paying very high rental prices these days and they also do deserve to be able to go in and have a look at their local museum. So if we could maybe um, through the mover um, include it to also include you know, resident. Oh, resident. Resident, yeah, just resident, local resident. Mm. That can partly, yeah, my point too about residents, not just great players. Um, by doing this, would that have an impact on other museums that are in this council area that are community run, or you know, would that have an impact on them? Would hope not. Good question. Uh, through uh, Mayor Bailey, look, it may. Um, obviously, we can't control that, but we can control what decisions council makes. Um, it needs to be considered, I suppose. Mm. Um, it's a, a reasonable point. Uh, uh, maybe um, Council Davis or um, who else is on the committee? Mm -hmm. It's yourself. Uh, uh, I was there. And uh, Council Forrester may want to talk around the rationale behind it, clearly to promote visitation um, to a cohort that don't visit. Um, those museums. So, but I'll leave that to the members of the committee. To, like, yeah, the discussion was that um, basically, you know, you've seen the budget for this area. So, ratepayers are subsidising mm -hmm. this by a lot. The idea was that um, about to go out with the rates notice in the newsletter that goes out. So, that way, ratepayers get it, whereas residents don't necessarily mm -hmm. get it. So, that's sort of why the, that wording was used. Um, anything else to add and and we also thought that you know if you've got a rate payer in Adelaide 
but that way they will actually come up and use it. You know, and we thought that would be a good thing because they might bring their friends or come back. You know, the whole idea is to get more people in so that ratepayers are subsidising less in those areas. Um, I just wanted to add that the, the vouchers that come out in the rate notice are also transfer, transferable. So you can give it to your family or or whoever as well. It wasn't tenors, just for the tenors. Yeah, tenors, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. or, but you know, you could just be able to manage it. You can use it yourself. So I think that's where we were heading with it. We also discussed about volunteers um, having vouchers as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so if you get the voucher through the getting the newsletter which comes to the ratepayer, how do we get it to the renter? Mm -hmm. Through the chair now. Sorry, I've seen that. Uh, at the moment we don't. Mm -hmm. So the report that came from the committee um, was around uh, ratepayers. So it would need to be some consideration to on um, changing the motion or uh, something from a logistical perspective to look at. Uh, yeah, and I guess that the more of a reason is because we're already printing that. It doesn't cost anything extra. So we're trying to keep the cost down, but get the usage up. And for me, I've got tenants and, you know, if they want the, the waste voucher, I just order it and give it to them. So if you've got a good relationship with the landlord, I guess you need to ask that. That's what happened. Um, just in regards to that, I thought, I guess the way you could do it was just if residents were interested in, you know, having a time frame where the vouchers were made available at, say, the Manamosa office or Canberra office or wherever, um, where an actual resident with a valid ID came to provide and, you know, like that I live in Manam, here's my driver's licence or my healthcare card or whatever it is, um, and then a voucher can just be distributed mm. over the counter at the office to those residents that are just renters. I know a lot, you know, you're a great landlord, but I know probably a lot of landlords in the area that wouldn't necessarily pass that. You know, they live in the city, they're not going down to see their renter, they're getting the money every week, but they're not necessarily going to go down and visit them with a voucher for the museum. So I yeah, was keep um know who's coming in once and you know like then we have to keep records of who's coming in but it's true quite a yeah. i don't know how many people would have it, it would exploited like, if we did it over a short amount of time i don't see how exploited it would be if we just did it. it's like they're available for a couple of weeks or something you know like not like we have someone has to do that all the time but mm -hmm. just maybe after the rate notice goes out allowing a time frame for lo putting it out in the matter mag or something allowing other like low income renters to be able to have an opportunity to come in um, it, you know, I don't think we'd have too many people exploit it for getting extra, you know, troops in there. I think it wouldn't be done that way. And either way, it promotes it's locals going there. Um, through the um, mayor, uh, look, obviously it's up to council's decision, but could uh, one potential option is that further consideration give to your suggestion, mm -hmm. Councillor Hammond, mm -hmm. and we can come back with some mm -hmm. logistical mm -hmm. considerations. Mm -hmm. I don't, I Gary, pass over to Gary. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't like making decisions without actually thinking it through. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one option. Just a suggestion, maybe. Uh, we previous council, we issued um, a um, permit or access, uh, and the council simply said there are 50 Hi. vouchers available, mm -hmm. and the first 50 people to get it. Yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, through the chair, I was going to suggest could have done the same way as the uh, waste transfer vouchers. You actually apply for it, and that way you're it's registered as to who's actually applied for the voucher, and if they if they get it, so you've got a record. So, what Ben suggested is that we leave it as it is now, and then we do some more yeah. work and come back yeah. with yeah. an extra yeah. idea. At least we know the administrative yeah. problems or you know challenges yeah. if we do that. Alternatively, you can fill the item. Well. Yeah, uh, up to the meeting and the second that comes up, they just think that's one by other. I kind of like it how it is. I think it should be more, it should be more um, discussion I think that's what mm. um, around that. But initially, our thought was to, we did have residents initially when we discussed this at the meeting, um, but we felt that rate payers should be getting something for their rates. It's a, it's a um, council facilities. Um, and so we're looking at the rate payers. But any other idea? Absolutely. Mm. If we've got some other suggestions for how we can um, maybe go a bit further, then sure. So this yeah. is just a start. Yeah, just a start. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll be happy to go with that for the yeah. 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 Further discussion. Yeah. Yeah.
So he leaked us the first one that I read out. Any further discussion on that? No, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. Good discussion and we will await more things from that council on that. Uh, 12.8, nomination for the South Australian Regional Organisation of Council Member. And I've spoken to governance and if I don't get a payment for this, I can still chair for this part of the meeting. So the recommendation is that the report be received, that Mayor Simone Bailey be endorsed by Council to be nominated for a position on the Marylands and Riverland grouping of the South Australian Regional Organisation of Councils that the CEO be authorised to submit the nomination form on behalf of Council to the Local Government Association of SA by 16 August 2024. And everyone's coming ahead. We're all letting you do it. <laughs> Councillor Davis and Councillor McGregor. <laughs> Councillor Hammond. I just want to say, firstly, it's so great to see how beautifully active you want to be in all the things to help within our region. This isn't the first extracurriculum council group that you have signed yourself up for. Um, so we appreciate you doing that for everything that it can then you know, trickle down to us with. Um, uh, my question is, like, I mean, you're in a few now, you, as long as you don't burn out, as long as you, you know, I don't know how many more you're going to sign up to, but you've got a lot of energy, so, but we're happy to support you in all of it and go well with it. I hope you get in. Oh, thank you. That's not happening. I don't know that want is the word, but, you know, they, my chef goes, you can't complain about something if you don't get in there and try and change it. Totally. So, Councillor Barla. Yeah, I simply wrote down one comment regarding this. Uh, more work. Yeah. <laughs> when I go in, I go in full. <laughs> Any further questions, discussion? One other, one other question. Um, would it be possible, I don't know if it relates to with our strategic planning and everything within council, we obviously approve you to go onto these committees, but is it right that we'd be maybe sometimes getting reports back on stuff that you're finding out from those committees? I mean, I don't know if it's just something you want to do annually just to say what we've done in the last year in, in some of these little organisations that you're in just so we can be abreast of the great work that those organisations are doing to help the region. Mm -hmm. So all of them, all of that is including my mayor's report. Mm. So you can pick out points and just ask me to okay. a meeting or send me an email. Most of the things I go to are all public, so I can mm. send you a little link to agendas and minutes mm. and things like that. Um, this one may not even get on. It's just a nomination. But yeah. yeah, definitely. And all of the Sarok um, agendas and minutes are available on the LGA website. Yeah, everyone. Have a look as well. Any further questions? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour? Against that is carried. 12.9 public consultation policy review. The recommendation is that the report be received, the public consultation policy version 6 be adopted, and that the CEO be authorised to make minor amendments to the public consultation policy. Do we have a mover? Councillor Barber and Councillor Hammond, do we have any discussion, questions, feedback on that? Well done, Carrie. <laughs> uh, yeah, again, from what I've been yeah. feeling and hearing in the public, people are you know, really excited about us looking in and being more serious about public consultation. So if we have no discussion, we will put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is Carrie. Thank you. 13.1, facilities review, more than the public library, more than activity centre. Oh, um, there is a recommendation there that the report be received. The Morgan Library be closed on Saturday mornings as of the 3rd of August, at a saving of approximately $6,000 per annum. The Morgan Activity Centre be kept in its current location. And question four, uh, section four has three parts, um, either there's no change, they're reduced to one day or uh, close it. And then five is close the Northern office from 12.15 to one. All right, we're back on, Darren. Yes. All right. Just note um, through Mebali that we had a technical issue. And yes. So um, our cameras dropped out or internet dropped out. So we paused the meeting um, to ensure that uh, we were still live streaming.
And so, yeah, so far we've had a mover and a seconder. Councillor McGregor has spoken, and we will use um, proper council uh, meeting procedure for this item. Councillor McGregor, have you got a question? Yeah, so um, I just wanted to sort of go into... Oh, yeah, you didn't bit. actually no, speak. No, no, no yeah, so to and then, yeah. start. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, just uh, some reasoning as to how I've landed mm -hmm. where I have and then set up in the room. So um, it, we're sort of... Um, we're undertaking this review um, and I think that the listening to the the rate payers and, and their views, you know, I think that we we need to make sure that we um, yeah, can sort of make the savings but also supporting them. So for that, that part of the motion is that the staff that are still employed, so we're not looking at reducing the staffing sort of um, numbers, so there will be still staff employed that can support that transition through for, for the hub, so the Blanchetown hub. So the Blanchetown hub have previously been an autonomous, or it's still an autonomous organisation and do some really great, phenomenal work um, and for their community and and, and, and very supportive of, of council. Um, and I just think it's, it's time, council probably needs to step out of their space and allow them to do what they can do. But there will still be that support in getting, um, you know, the um, community groups around the kiosk library and the continuation of the Centrelink um, access point. So I'd like to sort of see that. So that's why I've landed on that particular one. Well, I did hedge between the two, but I just thought, you know, the, I was one with that sort of support. Um, that's, you know, is what I, what I would expect that would happen. I, I don't think they're missing the... The, the point there that there still will be staff still there to support them in the interim in the in the interim transitioning there. Um, just in regard to the activity centre and the reduced to three days. So I did ask a question um, that I was happy to have answered here, uh, just to make sure that we have our fees and charges that would cover the higher of the rooms at the MAC for the days when we're not running, the council's not running those community um, sessions. So, you know, do we have the fees and charges um, in place so that uh, uh, another community group could hire or a, an, a, an organisation that wants to sort of do other sort of training or whatever could sort of hire that sort of space or some of the rooms or even the kitchen hire. And so... It still provide a add-on benefit for services um, without council actually doing that. Um, so yeah, so that's why I've you know I've landed on that way. Um, clarify two things. So there are um, savings in wages if option um, closing either mm -hmm. one or two days. Um, so there are staff savings because we wouldn't need the um, same hours. Um, so we have a casual position at the moment. Um, that does uh, can cover uh, hours in Morgan, um, and my understanding is it's the higher of the Mac is on the fees and charges. It is, uh, yes, through the chair that there is fees and charges for the higher of the Mac. Just ask the seconder if they want to speak for the motion. Councillor McGregor, you want to ask any questions? Uh, through the chair. Um, I was, you probably know, so I was, I was a reluctant secondary promotion because it was a lot. Anything was going to move forward. Um, I am concerned. I do have concerns regarding closing down the Blanche Town Hub completely. But, um, but if there's a guarantee that there is going to be support from the council to make sure that there's a smooth transition and that there are still services available to the community through council's assistance, um, I, I, could, I could accept that motion, um, that option. Um, I also have a question regarding reducing the MAC to three days per week. There doesn't seem to be, there wasn't anything really listed as far as so there didn't seem to really be any savings involved there. So my question is, um, if we're reducing it by two days a week, why is there no savings there? 
So through, sorry, Ben. Did you have a ten minutes? Uh, through the chair, the savings are only about 2,200, and that's just small components of electricity and water. So the building still operates, so there's still costs associated with having insurances and utilities. Um, what they've done is an estimation, given it's not going to be used necessarily for 40% uh, of the time that it's currently utilised. <laughs> Um, on your first question, and Gary might expand on this, um, so there is going to be support from council to try to work with community groups to offer a kiosk library and uh, other services. Obviously, that's dependent on those community groups um, facilitating those. So we can't guarantee it. But we'll was successful at the starting days and then has really gone into an area of maybe not being so successful for them. <laughs> um, so that's why my concerns with a community group in Blanchetown of elderly burnt out volunteers that are already giving to lots of other organisations, how successful that will be in a handover. Um, I'm going to be running against this motion because I do believe that we should have gone with option 4B um, to reduce it down to one day, at least for, say, the next financial year to help them in a process of establishing themselves as a more thoroughly organised volunteer organisation in the hand of, like I say, we're going to give them some hours of support. But I mean, we're, we're reducing hours at Morgan. They all said they'll find to lose Saturday mornings. We're reducing hours. We're showing them we're trying to really hone in on the expenses that are unsustainable for us. There's a difference between sustainability of our council functions and removing all community assets from our community areas that are isolated. Blanchetown is a long way from Morgan. You know, there's no public transport really taking them to places. In the feedback, we got a lot of great suggestions of how these spaces could be utilised more, how, like, you, you know, we could be doing more in these spaces. Um, and I know we did talk about the mobile lending library that could help support other regions like, say, you know, Tunkilo and, and Sudan and Canberra where there is no library services. And I think that we could see some kind of model of what the mobile lending library would be for our community to be able to extend to our whole wider region of the region. So it seems equitable for all rate payers to feel like they're paying for a service that is going to be eventually coming their way too. I know that would help a lot of Ponzi people and people in my region that feel isolated, feeling like, well, at least we get the mobile lending library once a month or whenever it comes. There are other options we could explore, but I, yeah, I'm going to be voting against because I do believe we should have gone, which is reducing it down to one day, making it the Thursday, which is a busy day. People aren't back there yet from the floods. And I feel like we're going to see younger families coming to that area and we're going to have a service closed down that won't come back. So I'm worried about that for them. That is all. Can I just ask Gary and Ben what your recommendation would have been for that option? Mm -hmm. Like, do you have a one that you weigh in on? Okay. Uh, through the chair, I think in terms of the sustainability drive for council, you would close the branch down community cut purely from a financial perspective. But if you take it from a community perspective, you, you, you would take a different perspective. You're that. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Councillor Schultz and Councillor Forrester. And so everyone will speak for or against just one. So you just make sure you, like, you can ask as many questions as you like. I would um, be in favour of the second option in point four because at least it's it's toning it down and not completely cutting something out. Give it a trial, see how it pans out. If you still don't get much usage, then come back to this place to determine whether it closes. And as far as the three days a week at the mat. I'm just wondering how you're going to fit all those activities in the three days a week. That was not the thing. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor, got a chance. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I, the report we received, uh, the Morgan Library closed on Saturday mornings, yeah, definitely. Uh, it doesn't, if it doesn't get supported, but the Morgan Activity Centre, I think must remain open five days a week. It's as Gary's just said, it, it's costing us minimal money on those if we close it for those two days. Um, I believe the only change to Blanchetown is that it opens one day per week. 
we've had a, an officer that goes there, and that officer that goes there, um, she continues to uh, other work that she does for council. Like, it's just like working for home, but she shifts her office and do, does on the computer. I was there at one of the consultations, and that lady was working just as hard as if she was in her office here at Manor or wherever. And I do agree with closing the Morgan office from 12 to 12.15, 1 p.m. on the Monday or the, on the Monday to Friday. Thank you, Councillor Forrester. Councillor Davis. Um, yeah, I was leaning towards the option B, what do you call it, in four as well, just um, not closing it completely. I think that being open one day per week is important for Blanchetown. And I agree that, um, you know, if they want it to be open more, then that, that conversation still happens. So um, I think closing it completely would be very detrimental to Blanchetown. Has anyone else spoken, Vanessa? You like to speak. <laughs> Most people know who yeah. I'm speaking. Yeah. 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 I should. Not you, I mean, many new this year, so. Yeah, um, I've, I've really struggled with this, of course. Um, <clears throat> it's a, a difficult process that we're going through. Um, the, issue, the things that I read in the report were that only 6.6% of the residents actually participated in the review at Blanchetown. Um, and also, it's not really a long way to Morgan. I know there are people who can't die, but it's only 30 minutes to Morgan. And the other thing about the closure of the activity centre, I saw that people were saying that there is difficulty getting the volunteers five days a week up at Morgan. That was in the report. So... These are the considerations that I had when I ended up leaning towards biting the bullet and going with the motion as it stands. Thank you. Could I just answer Councillor Peaks? Um, there is no problem getting volunteers for the Morgan Activity Centre. No problem at all. Can we have staff view on that, please? Uh, through the mayor, I'm not sure that that is the case. We do really struggle, um, and I think the concern is that the, the volunteers that we have are getting worn out. So there's that that consideration as well that we're trying to um, encompass. A uh, question for staff: If we do go with the close the Morgan Activity Centre on the two days a week, is there a possibility of, say, the meeting room in Morgan, like the locks would have to be changed so that look, that it's at least open for those few people that would have used it to do puzzles or whatever in a nice quiet space? Yes, sort of an op option. Uh, through the chair, we did look at the option. There wasn't a huge expense around the FOB setup. up um, the top of my head, I think it was about 6000 Um but there may be a different way we could configure it. But because it didn't get a lot of support, we didn't go too far down that path. So th through the chair, I think um, the team could look at alternatives, whether it's use of the library um, for those two days, um, whether it's the office that you've got, the mini room, potentially. Um, if there was a demand, um, we can investigate it thoroughly. So there's a, there would be potential options to consider that if that was the case. Mm -hmm. oh. Would you like to close out or would you? Yeah, um, through, the, through the mayor. Um, so listening to the, the the discussion points and the, the valid input and everything like that, and I know that it is really hard, you know, I think it is. Um, I am prepared to change my motion um, with change it from um, the part um, the third yeah. part on the English stamp to the second option. Uh -huh. um, but as if the, the second there agrees, but I would like to make sure that we get really good statistics and figures as to how that is going and be working to the option of the third option. So it will be a transition, but we're still working towards that. 
but it sort of does give that buffer. Second, though, would you be happy with that? Through there, um, I'm happy to change it to option B for number four. Um, and I'm also considering maybe put a time frame on that option, like for a 12 month period. If you open one day a week for a 12 month period, it gets reviewed. If the use is, um, is not really there for that 12 month period, then they will be moved forward to the other option. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just clarity on the yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> Help. <laughs> because it's not actually an amendment to the variation, it's, uh, it's an amendment to motion, it's variation. Mm -hmm. You actually have to seek leave of the meet, the rest of the meeting for permission. To vary, to vary the motion and then proceed with the variation before mm -hmm. there can be any debate on the on the variation itself. Okay. Seek leave of the meeting. Seek leave of the meeting. So, so, so get I have a vote and just check that people are happy for the motion to be varied without the existing motion being put. So Thank do you. that bit yes. first. Yeah. And then we can work on the variation and we can debate yeah, the debate variation that. and then put the new motion. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> that sound good? Yep. Yeah, I, I, I vote to leave of the motion. Seek the leave and leave that motion. Vary <laughs> the motion to include point B instead of point C. Mm -hmm. All those in <clears throat> favour and against, that is carried. <laughs> So now you can debate. And now we're not in the meeting. Uh, so, so now, now you can debate. The, yeah. Now the you can meeting. have free discussion. Not free no, discussion, it's still meeting procedures. Yeah. So one person speaking at a yeah. time. So the motion, the motion will be varied now. So we'll put the variation up. And then technically, <coughs> you can, I'll just check. Um, because it's such a critical issue, mm. maybe just all have one more say on the variation mm. because it's going to impact the community. Yeah. Right. And if you choose to. If you choose not to, mm. you don't need to, but if you would like to have another say, have another say. On the variation which Carol's highlighted in yellow, which was point two of item four. No, no everything else three. stays yeah. the same. Yeah. Council's project opaque. So can I just ask, would we then mm -hmm. add, uh, are we saying that we would like to add a time frame for review of that decision into the motion? I would support that. Was that another variation or is that just amending okay, um, the variation? Mandy, um, oh, sorry, not Mandy, um, okay. Council McGregor, pose that as part of a variation. It can be posed as part of the variation, but we can also have two amendments. So if we just technically, it's reading procedures can be a bit complex. So if we just put it in as part of the variation, that would be the easiest way to manage yeah. it in this instance. Okay. Yep. Councillor McGregor. So, yeah. Are you happy with that? Yeah, I'm happy with that. And we will be with so just sorry for we just might get the wording mm. right for that. Yeah. So it might be um for a would be reduced to the Blanchetown Community Hub Services for one day. Mm -hmm. uh, B um, would be a review be undertaken um, after 12 months uh, of yeah. usage. Yeah. Or, or can we do the, the review in June, June so that we're ready for next mm -hmm. budget period so we're not yeah. doing it after the budget's been set? Mm -hmm. well, uh, a review yeah. be undertaken uh, within 12 months yeah. Yeah. on mm -hmm. the um, usage of the Blanchetown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And exactly. options available. Yeah. For A and B. Yeah. 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 My only concern, I guess, with the 12 months is with regards to, you know, Blanchard being like a flood affected river shack area where in 12 months' time, they won't be, we know that our recovery process from the flood is going to be so crazy. For a lot of those people rebuilding their homes 12 months, they won't be back yet, you know, like. Um, even though I know we're wanting to do it for our financial records in a 12 months period, I think this is such a serious issue where we're looking at really closing down the services. I think maybe, you know, 24 months, if not seems like, well, why are we giving it an extra two years? That gives them two years to fully develop their own sustainable 
how they're going forward as a community hub. Um, it gives them also a better rope of statistics. We only had six months of stats, and I don't think we've necessarily seen that Blanchetown have really seriously dropped in attending the hub as much as they all got flooded and got moved out and haven't come back for holidays and haven't been down visiting their properties as much as they might have in previous years. So which is why I think maybe, I mean, the review it's happened. The review. It's hmm? the review. It's through, 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 through the chair, can I just make a comment on that response to as well, um, is I would think, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Gary and Amy, that the majority of the use, which I think photocopy was the most significant, is done by locals. Mm -hmm. And so they were not as significantly in fact impacted mm -hmm. by, um, so permanent residents, so yeah, okay, um, the holiday homes that you refer to, um, whether they're there or not, they don't necessarily use the facilities. Is that a fair yes. comment? Uh, through the chair, a little bit of both, I guess, is a little bit of library um, usage from shack owners. Um, but yeah, generally it's mainly local, um, local residents. Councillor um, Baines. I was just going to say that I think 12 months is is a good amount of time um, and lots of things can happen in 12 months. I know there's new businesses going in Larchdown, mm -hmm. for example. Um, and, yeah, anything can happen. But as um, Mayor Bradley was saying, it's a review mm -hmm. and we can look at that. And mm -hmm. if there's other things that impact, then maybe go a bit longer, but it's just a review. So yeah. I think 12 okay. months is, is a good amount of time. Yeah. It's true, Mayor Bradley. Um, just to clarify where we're at. We've got a variation and people can speak to that yes. now. They can yeah. speak to that now. And Councillor McGregor, as the mover of the original motion, has the right to close mm -hmm. the debate. Mm -hmm. So okay. if Councillor McGregor speaks, she closes the debate on the variation. Okay. Do you have us? Councillor Schultz. So it, basically I can't query this this um Morgan activity point any more than can I? You can okay. you can discuss whatever you like. It's just if Councillor yeah. McGregor speaks, she will close the debate and then you'll have to vote. But she needs to speak last. Um yeah, I'm still having problems with this point three. What's the point in reducing the map being opened at three days per week if it's not saving any money and you're gonna have trouble squeezing in those programs for three days? I don't get it, sorry. So I think, Amy, um, it's around volunteer demand um, and the limited use on those other two days. So whatever the program that is set is based on the current program. And so that'll be modified um, if it's to do three days. Yeah. My understanding is that um, it's only one or two um, that come along on the Thursdays and Fridays, and they are people that come along on the other days. Um, and sometimes, correct me if I'm wrong, the volunteer is there I'm wondering if other people will come in. So it, it's probably a volunteer. So, so could you possibly have two four hours space to, so that everyone can accommodate? I mean, you, if you're going to close Friday, you're going to lose strength for life, and there might be people that are really into that. Um, in regard to strength for life, there are some conversations happening about um, where that might, it will still happen, but where it might happen. Um, regarding the program, it changed. If they would just work out. Maybe this is the start of building a community capacity, and that's what I'd like to see, like, do council do this in any other town? So those two days, it would be great for community to build that capacity to start doing that. Uh, where were we up to? Who was speaking when that happened? Was it Korea? Um, yeah, I'll just up to you. I was just going to say in regards to um, what you were talking about, community building our community com um, capacity, which is really what we are aiming to do with this Blanchetown hub. Um, and I was just suggesting that maybe to Amy that maybe it could be a possible possibility for the Madam Activity Centre volunteers to engage with the Blanchetown Morgan activity? Morgan activities. <laughs> you said Madam Activity. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the Morgan Activity Centre volunteers to maybe have an engagement with the Blanchetown to help with the idea of community capacity building for them to be able to take ownership of the hub more independently. I think both <laughs> community groups could maybe benefit from a bit of cross 
discussions or something, but I mean, from what I was speaking to you was about that they've already are really running a lot of the similar programs anyway, and it may not be beneficial in the break. I just went direct, but I'm not sure if that would help or not. Yeah, the Blanchstone community runs so many activities mm. on their whole, and they do have ownership, really. It's mm. just, yeah, the council area and through the mayor which yeah just to clarify so it doesn't that doesn't change mm. so we're just talking which they own the building mm. it's the actual council office mm. component which mm. is on the left as you walk in mm. yeah and if it is photocopying and stuff over the next 12 months we can work out if that's all people want mm. then we can just give them a photocopy yeah or like uh anyone else have any questions would you like to close it out councillor mcgregor I will, yes. Um, so uh, the motion that is on the table, just in regards to the Morgan Activity Centre in those two days of closing, I think having the, in my sort of thing, having the ability that other organisations or other community groups can pay to use that, that space on the Monday, on the Friday, could in, improve or increase sort of the, the activities there for for the public of Morgan. So not taking away, but there, there will be different opportunities. Um, and then and that's up to the organizations or the um the community to say, hey, look, that's what we want. And and we look at it and they look at doing that. Um yeah, I was just going to sort of say mention the Blanchetown hub that they do own their building. So it's not we're not take closing that. It's just the facility. So yep, I'm happy that the motion as it stands. Go ahead. Thank you very much. And I'll just read the motion in full so that everybody knows what they're voting on. The recommendation is that the report be received, that the Morgan Library be closed on a Saturday morning as of the 3rd of August 2024 at a saving of approximately $6,000 per annum. The Morgan Activity Centre be kept in its current location and opening days be reduced to three days per week. Reduce the Blanchetown Community Hub service to one day only per week for four hours at a saving of approximately $15,000 per annum and a review be undertaken within 15 months on the usage of the plant. 12, 12, 12, 12 months. <laughs> Thank you for picking that up, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> on the We're usage of the Blanchetown <laughs> Community Hub and close the Morgan office from 12.15 p.m. to 1 p.m. on Monday to Friday. <laughs> Okay, everyone's clear on what we're voting on. <laughs> uh, I will put that motion up. All those for and against? Score of division. Ah, uh, a division can't be called on an amendment. Sorry. But it will be in the recording. Do you want to just clarify the vote then? Just make sure everyone's got their hands up. Really yeah. Right. Okay. Yep. For and against? That is carried. Okay, 13.2 transfer and oh, before I get to that, acknowledge the hard work done. Thank you, Gary, Amy, Nat, all of the team, the community consultation, everything was done so well. Thank you to all of the elected members that turned up for the consultation and listened. Um, and, and all care for the community. You could see that this was one of the hardest decisions I think this council has made um, because we do care so much about the community. So thank you, everybody that, um, you know, right through from consultation through to the report, we do know that this impacts community and I do hope that the community understand that we are listening and that we're trying to make the best decisions for a sustainable council, but also, you know, the, the significant <laughs> impact of the community. And I really do hope that we can build that community capacity because we do have 83 suburbs, 17 towns, 52 shack communities, a very big area and we can't do everything for everyone. So for me, building capacity is the biggest thing and keeping that connection happening. So thank you, everyone involved. Now we have my 13.2, Transfer Station Sustainability Review. And the recommendation is that the report be received and that council endorse the transfer station schedules as applied from the 2nd of October 2023 for the 24-25 financial year with a further assessment to be undertaken of the transfer station operations prior to the 25-26 financial year. Do we have a mover? 
Councillor Hammond and a seconder. Councillor Schultz. Do we have any discussion? Councillor Butcher and Pete, then Councillor Barber. Thank you. Um, yep, I support the um, extension of the time period, time period for uh, further review. Um, uh, subject to that, um, the idea of looking at further rural recycling and township green waste, um, just looking at the costing of all that included in this review, as you as has been proposed, I totally support that. Um, I will, because I'm very keen to look at, in the long run, uh, after this review, uh, that, that more consideration is given to the closure of some of these facilities. You know, it's, we know that it's, uh, it's historical that there are, there are 10 facilities. Obviously, Cambrai is a completely different proposition because it's a, a waste recycling facility. The others are all collection depots. Um, and uh, just having a quick look at the travel time, uh, losing four of those would mean the maximum change would be 30 minutes travel for people living in our region. So, yep, I support this approach. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I've got some issues uh, with, the, um, with the current uh, hours from the transfer stations. Uh, I'll use our local transfer station example, Bow Hill, um, going from two and a half hours per week to one hour per month. And I'm sure that there's others in a similar situation. Some of the, um, I guess they're classified now as seasonal transfer stations. Um, the curbside collection, which has come up in the report, well, that's as far as I'm aware, that's a totally user pays funded um, situation. Um, and also notice in the report that it says uh, looking at further refinement. Well, once again, it's with Bow Hill as the example, it's already been reduced by 90%. So uh, if you're looking at further refinement, you're, you're basically shutting the station down. Um, because uh, we, my, my wife and I used to use the Bow Hill transfer station, but we haven't been able to use it for months because either I'm at work or like the one hour that it's open, it's just it's just not. We just can't get to it. So we actually take a, a lot of our recycling stuff to Murray Bridge now because that's open every day. If we're heading into Murray Bridge, we can just take it in there. So um, yeah, I think if the station's going to be open uh, to make it acceptable for people to be able to use it, I would like to see it go to one, uh, once a fortnight instead of one hour per month. That's just my thoughts on it. Well, the figures are there that are only 3.8 people are using it in that one time that it's open. So if you open up more, less use, more cost, that's a little bit difficult. Because we can't get there. Mm. That's that's the mm. issue. We just can't get there. Councillor Schultz. I'm just looking at the motion. It actually says, with a further assessment to be undertaken, that that assessment and refinement are two different meanings, and the assessment could go all the way. It would be... Or in the report, it said that there was an opportunity for the requirement. Yeah, but on on the motion, the motion. Councillor Hammond, um, just in a question in regards to that one hour Bow Hill example, with our staff being obviously we pay them a minimum of two hours to do any job. Like that's the law for the wages. So they're being paid for two hours. They no. drive to four different. Like, uh, so that's because right, they are just going to all of them. So they do a full drive. day, but they're spreading it out across the entire region. That's what I thought happened. But I was just making clarity that we're not employing someone for just one hour and then paying them for two hours and they're only open once. Okay, just stop checking them doing we're, the right things. We're across the IR. Okay. I thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> that, though, is a potential oh. solution. You know, I do know one of the other council. I think it was Wakari. They just have a two hour and the person's employed in Wakery. So whether, you know, if we do get to that, that they just be a Bow Hill resident mm -hmm. rather than someone driving around yeah. opening, I guess, but it's something that can be looked into when we do the further assessment. Mm -hmm. Any further questions or does anyone want to speak? Councillor Tochi okay. Sorry, yeah, just to add uh, uh, Councillor Barber's comments reminded me that yes, I think the way the way that it's happening at the moment yeah. has actually probably led to some increased dumping because of this 
kind of response to what's happened. And also, I think there is a lot of confusion about when they're open at the moment. So I, my view is that if we consolidate, then we can have more consistency and, and even more frequency if we're able to dispose of some land as a result of the rationalisation of closing some of them. Um, then we might be able to say, well, these those remaining will be open more and more consistently um, to enable, you know, better services. And through Mayor Bailey, one of the challenges is that, um, unfortunately, there's not four weeks in every month. So we have a schedule, um, but we can't open on every fourth um, Sunday, for example, because then what do you do for the fifth one um, and the rotation of staff? So it does, we, we hear that. We understand it. Um, we've tried to do what we can, but if you aren't able to have open consistency, it does create some <coughs> challenges around that. And through the chair, <clears throat> there's been a fair bit of education in regards to setting uh, all of the opening hours as well. Uh, we've got QR codes on each each gate, so they can actually open it up, and that'll go straight to the website, which will bring up the actual transfer station. Uh, so they don't have to go through the calendar. The calendar is a little bit difficult because we have to put the, uh, uh, the four weekly openings into it. Um, and uh, But there is a fair bit of education. There are calendars being uh, being made to go at the rates notice now. Uh, we couldn't do it last year because we were mid-term. Um, so there are calendars going out. So uh, look, if there's anyone that needs a hand, they can just ring us and we can give them the dates um, because they are specific sites uh, th that are there. And in, in regards to uh, what Ben said, we work on a north-south rotation. I'll do the I'll call them the major sites or the higher visitation first, and then over the next two weeks, then they incorporate those other ones in those in the same routine. So they actually just work a longer day on those those other sites. Uh, right. So they do the shorter shorter uh, two weeks, mm -hmm. longer two weeks, shorter two weeks, longer two weeks. Can I ask Dave? Somebody from Truro suggested that their transfer station is very busy because the Brossa only has one over at Sprint, and so it's quicker. Do we check that? People are definitely our residents before we charge. Like, are we charging the other councils the higher rate? Uh, through the chair, in the report, it says that I think it was 91 in that later, later period, and that income actually went up. So it's a higher income at Truro. Um, we do, in our fees and charges, we do have a resident and a non resident uh, fees and charges. So, yeah, they do check. Um, and a lot of people in the Barossa do use Truro because the only one that Barossa's got is in Springton, and I think it's only open on Saturday, Saturday morning. For us, we only have one transfer station. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah and I guess that's a big lesson for us. We're, we're potentially unsustainable. We have 10 transfers, yet the Barossa is, you know, a big area and they only have one at Springton. Yeah. Hopefully, if we get the bins right, so that the sites can get picked up, things like that, then the issue may not have to be done. The bin service won't even get look at the rationalising. It's a dumb no brainer. It's not a paper. Regionally, we have a paper for the recycling. Yeah. yeah, at the moment, we're yeah. not even discussing. I go to the dump every month. All of our recycling goes into landfill. Any further discussion, <laughs> questions, feedback? <clears throat> Noting that we will be reviewing this within the next 12 months. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, just, um, just on that, just talking about recycling, I think that is a lot of reason why people oh. use the transfer station, especially in places where I live, we don't have recycling. Mm -hmm. um, so if that's definitely been looked at and that, you know, is an option, I think that will make a huge difference if you've got Just noting there'll be an additional cost to each household of that yeah, yeah. And that's the yeah. challenge that I was going to say yeah. to you, Mayor Bailey, is that we have looked at it previously and it'll be about cost yeah. because it's um, you know got to be affordable, um, but because of the geographical nature and the large distances, um, <coughs> so it might be quite expensive. Yeah. Right? It's through the chair. Um, as it may be aware, we, we commenced the negotiations for the new contract with Solo. Um, so we've already met with them on working out what other services they can provide because historically they, they know what they can provide and what, uh, what is available. So we've asked them to look into green waste into various towns or whether it's just the southern towns because of the rainfall. Uh, I've also asked them to do an assessment on the rural pickup. Um, basically, they're going to bring it back to Canberra anyway. We're going to dump it on into the shed and see how much recyclables are in there. So then obviously that'll give us viability as to whether it is recyclable and whether the, uh, the option there is to then have a or turn it pick up in the rural area as a red bin, then a yellow bin, red bin, yellow bin. So we're looking through all those options now with the uh, contract, contractor to see exactly what this feasible process is. But we'll, we'll be checking what, uh, I suppose, auditing the dumping or the, or the collection uh, bins and doing an assessment on those so we can actually see what is happening. And it will probably uh, it will go right through after October when the holiday homes come back in as well. Mm -hmm. 
Great, fun times ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'd just like to say a quick comment on that is I do believe in canvassing the local Pondy Cal. We're a community of a regional area that we would all be very happy to have a fortnightly bid. No one fills it in a week for a recycling bid to happen, the alternate fortnight. I've spoken to most of my neighbourhoods. They all currently put their recycling in the landfill bin, so even though I tell them to go to the, the dump and when the dump's open, yeah. it's just so much easier to put something in a bin and if it's not full anyway, just throw it in there. So we're seeing a lot of recycled contamination yeah. and I'd like to see a change to that in our regional areas. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any further discussion? If not, Victoria, you I'm still on. I didn't talk. Look. It, it was off. off. It was going off and off. Something was happening. Uh, we will put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. 14.1 minutes of the Mid Murray Council Assessment Panel meeting held on the 17th of June 2024. The recommendation is that the report be received and that minutes of the Mid-Murray Council Assessment Panel meeting held on the 17th of June 2024 be received. We've got a mover. Councillor Barber, Councillor Schultz is seconding that. Do we have any questions? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. 14.2, minutes of the Mid-Murray Heritage and Maritime Committee meeting held on the 26th of June 2024. The recommendation is that the report be received and the minutes of the Mid-Murray Heritage and Maritime Committee meeting held on the 26th of June, 2024, be received. We've got a move by Councillor Davis, Councillor Barber is seconding that. And any discussion, yes. questions, feedback? Councillor Todjic Um, Yeah, I uh, watched the uh, last Heritage and Maritime Committee meeting online um, and I just want to express my concern and to say I'd like to have more information in the briefing uh, come back to Council about the um, canally costs uh, of the run, uh, which I think I'm correct in saying were loosely estimated at 40,000. So I'd like to really have an idea of what's going on because the grant has been expended, I understand, and that is a a huge concern to me because this could just be a massive budget overrun. Yeah. I, I would um, suggest that uh, if this committee uses up their budget and wants money from council, then it comes to council first rather than just, I don't know who approves it or what, but no, it, it should it, come to council. It does come yeah. to council. Yeah. It does. It um, if there is a budget, um, variation, then council considers those budget variations. So it's going to come to this council? Right? Depending if there is an overrun, and also depends if there's not other budget that can be identified to deliver the project. So, but council considers budget variations. Okay, thank you. But they might find it within their 950000 that they've got, and then it wouldn't necessarily come back and be and that would be all grant funding, it wouldn't be in council money. No, no, the 950 that we've allocated as a budget oh, for that area. area. So it's yeah. still there. Yeah. Look, there's a commitment, obviously, council, well, sorry, $1.5 million circa has been spent uh, delivering the um, restoration of this boat. Um, some of that money has been grant funding, and so council needs to make a decision on where we go to from here. Um, whether it's sustainable or not, Councillor Hodgson McPeak, that's obviously a business case has been developed. Um, as everyone will be aware, in the second tranche of uh, sustainability review, there's the maritime history tourism area will be reviewed. And so consideration will be about that. Unfortunately, and this is a council decision around priorities, um, fair to say that uh, using steam is a challenge. The Mayflower is obviously very successful um, and profitable. Uh, because you don't have those other elements, <clears throat> but I defer to the members on the committee. If they want to add anything else to that. Um, we've had discussion, I think, about this before, but um, there are a lot of skilled volunteers who I believe do a lot of the work that's needed on Canali, and I'm a little bit unsure as to why some of the con some of the work that's being done is being done by contractors, and I don't feel that a lot of it needs to be. I think a lot of it can be done when she gets back to Morgan because uh, he has some very 
skilled volunteers who can do a lot of the work and a lot of them won't come to Manham and do that work because they wanted to come back and do the work themselves back at Morgan. So that's something that hasn't been very clear, like as to what the volunteers can do and, you know, are we just paying as contracts to do some of the stuff when our volunteers could probably do the same work? Mm -hmm. It should obviously save a lot of money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not comment. I want to have in regards to the beautiful volunteers that work for the Maritime Museum, um, Maritime for both across Manham and Morgan, um, the boats. They do an incredible job. Um, I do feel like some of them may be doing more than what are considered volunteer hours per week from talking to some of the ones that volunteer on the Marion. You know, some of them are volunteering maybe 30 plus hours some weeks. And that is outside guidelines of how much you should be doing as a volunteer weekly. And I think my only concern, they all are very passionate about what they want to do and they'll give as much time as they possibly can to their passion projects, whether it falls within legal capacities of volunteering in your community or not. And I was wondering how we look at that within the, the model of how those boats are run at the moment of just burning out our elderly in these volunteer roles, but also where it gets to a point where it's, should be considered almost like a part-time position or paid position as opposed to a volunteer role. Um, and I have a question about notice in regards to boats, but I'll leave that to the end. Yeah, so <coughs> I think that volunteer area will be looked at in the sustainability review. So all of that will be noted and the boats wouldn't be here if we didn't have the volunteers. I don't think we could give you any more money. Um, any further questions in relation to the minutes? we're receiving love <laughs> that motion up all those in favor and against that is carried 15.1 mayor's monthly report recommendation is that the report be received councillor hammond is moving councillor barber is seconding and i did put a little note that i was going to talk more about the um nga in canberra but we've not really discussed that now but yeah just going on a different way of doing things and thinking we can have more any questions, feedback, discussion? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that is carried. 16.1, elected member monthly report. The recommendation is that the report be received. Councillor Barber and Councillor McGregor is seconding that. Do we have any questions for discussion? Councillor Sotchek and Pete. So I just a quick amendment to mine. I didn't make it to the Man and Progress lunch on the 13th of December. Thank you. Any further discussion? If not, we'll put that motion up. All those in favour and against, that's carried. Motions with notice, they're a new. <laughs> Questions with notice at 18.1, house numbering for dwellings in small townships. The following question on notice was received from Councillor Rod Schultz. What progress has been made for introducing house numbers for dwellings in small townships? And the reason for the question is that the St Anne Progress Association had requested action on this issue some, some time ago, as have concerned residents of Canberra. House numbers would simply identify location of dwellings, especially for emergency services purposes, as well as for utilities, et cetera. Larger towns have house numbers and rural properties have rural addressing, but small towns don't seem to have any uniform type of identification, which leads to confusion and long-winded explanations when residents are giving directions to their address. And the response is the numbering of blocks, both with and without dwellings within small townships is a project that has been highlighted by the community in the past. However, the project has not progressed due to the staff turnover, resourcing challenges and competing priorities. The project was not identified as a priority within council's new strategic plan. And therefore it will com be completed as resources become available. Although there is no current budget or timeline for this, However, if council determined that this project should be prioritised and provide direction for this to occur, a report could be provided to a future meeting of council to include nominated townships, timelines, resources required for costings and council's consideration. Um, are you okay with that? I think it's a pretty important sort of thing and I, it's, it's common sense move 
and a matter of safety for people in, you know, if, if there is a real emergency and a, and a child has to try and give directions to the uh, emergency services worker because their parent is, you know, in need. I I really couldn't see the point of it not being progressed because it wasn't on the strategic plan. I'm, I couldn't get that one. But I do think it does need to move along and if it needs a briefing session or a report to council. I was going to suggest a briefing session just so we know the ins and outs and mm. the time and mm. all of that. Is that okay? Sure, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Obviously, we had a number of workshops on mm. our strategic plan um, and it, as far as I was aware, it wasn't mentioned. So if it was identified as a strategic priority for council or a project that should be resourced, um, then that's probably when those conversations would be raised. So it's already been on the board prior to that. So as it says here, it, it, it hasn't progressed, but it's been acknowledged. Yeah, so we allocate resources um, and budget to the, uh, the areas of the project, um, sorry, that are prioritised through that plan. Um, we do a number of other things, but that um, occurs as resources and staffing is available. But as yeah, absolutely, we'll have a briefing. We'll have a briefing. Yeah. What's 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 the briefing? Yeah. Yeah. Council yeah. determines. Okay, questions yeah. without strategic questions, Councillor. Why hello again? Okay, so Friday night I'm down at the club, you know, through the metro, <clears throat> and there's this big boat going along the river. And it's Samarian and it's pitch black. And it's obviously on some corporate sponsorship boat trip happening at night. It's happened a few times down there on a Friday night that people said, is that, what boat is that? What boat is that? Oh, it's Samarian. My question is, of a strategic nature, obviously we're looking at the cost of, and, you know, Ben brought, brought it up, Theo, they just talked about the cost of steam, cost of wood firing up boats for events. Um, you know, the river at night, you're not going to see too much other than just the insides of the boat and really you're looking out at darkness and a cold, cold night on Friday night. I feel like should we be limiting the nighttime, ex, ex, you know, explorations of the river on our steamboat boats as opposed to maybe using the Mayflower, which doesn't cost as much to run, if people are just wanting like a nighttime little corporate cruise around the river and if we are trying to really showcase that boat to our sponsors and our fundraising people, that they should be done during the day when you are going to be seeing the beautiful red cliffs and the banks of the river and the bird life and all of that. It seems like a missed opportunity if they are doing fundraising events at night on that boat to understand the formal and other things that we might use it for of like school things like that. But this, I think someone said, was this a corporate event? Um, and then I feel like they're going to, not going to see the, A, they're not going to see the best of the river at that time. B, it's a lot of expense firing up the Marion just for a little cruise. And the other part of this question is because the people who operate the Marion at night are not necessarily going down the middle stream of the river. They're going on either side, how there is that law of going around. But at night time when they're the only boat on the river, they should be probably sticking to the main stream because they were coming in very, very close to people's houseboats quite fast on Friday night and they were causing quite a lot of ruckus on that side of the river. And I just thought that was another thing that was complained to me by one of the people on the houseboat was that they could be in the mainstream and not necessarily going right behind people's boats at night when it's probably quite dangerous to do so. That would be the Rockford Steam <coughs> dinner cruises that have been happening for years and years and years this time of year. Um, Rockford pay for those cruises. They um, go over the weekend. Um, and they travel at night, being steam dinner. Um, and they also are sponsor of the Marion as well. So this has been happening for years and years yeah. and years. Um, so it's it's not like a fundraiser thing. It's a it's a dinner that is booked two years in advance. It's very yeah. popular. Um, and obviously that money goes back to council for that event that they have. And the Mayflower is not big enough for dinner. True. No. Uh, further to that, through you, Mayor Bailey, um, just comment that. Um, so there's a fees and charges register, so there's a fee for um, oh, yeah. use hiring the, the boat. Um, it's not to us to dictate when people want Watch to it. use that or not. Um, you know, we're not going to tell, for example, Rockford's in this instance, you can only have it during the day if they want to do it at night, um, as long as we can operate it um, safely. Um, your comment on the driving of the Marion is um, uh, captained or skippered, mm -hmm. if what's the technical word, um, by qualified, very, very experienced people. So um, they would be operating the boats within the law um, and also whatever requirements they are um, obligated to do. So, um, you know, 
they're very experienced. So I'm not sure that we should be questioning um, the skippers uh, on the way that they operate the boats, but I'm happy to have a further um I witnessed input. it, Ben. It was very, very close to houseboat and it was very close to the shoreline. I think that at night time when there is no other boat on the river, if they are a regular thing that happens long term, they should be utilising the main strip of the river to be as least impactful. I don't, I'm not questioning their abilities at Skipperman, and during the day that would be the way you would do it, like left to right of the law maritime laws. But during the middle of the night, like or evening dinners, I think in the middle of the river will just cause a lot less wake action on the banks for people that are just settled in for the night. You know, at Mariana's are having their dinner on their boat to then experience the rocking of the Marion going past. That's not the law, though. The law is that's yeah. the river. Yeah. So the that's law doesn't right. change whether it's no. day or night. You have I think to but it doesn't have to be on either edge. It can be in the middle stream as long as you're left and right of each other vessels. The law is for the vessels, not left of the river, right of the river. It's left Four of the side. vessels. Mm, that could be in the middle of the stream. Okay. I suppose my comment, I take it on board. Um, I'm, I just had some complaints passed to me and I just thought I'd chase it up. I'm That's not it. going to you know, tell a skipper how to operate sure. the boat. I guess things like that, you can just email Ben and Ben can follow up and see what happened. But just ask some questions. Sure. I just had a quick comment regarding the um, Rockford cruises. They actually also benefit some uh, local community groups. A few years back, they pulled up at Pernod, they hired the uh, put it on hold for their dinner, so that community benefited yeah. from from that cruise as well. So, yeah. Rockford's are the reason you have labour. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Very generous <laughs> sponsors. <laughs> Just so. Any other questions without notice, yeah. Council we'll Member? Yeah. Mark on Okay, um, get through the mayor. So my um. Wait. Just a brief thing. There's been much um, community discussion about the number of cars the council owns and runs uh, across, the, across the board. Um, are we able to be given a, um, a breakdown? I'm happy for this in a briefing to the number of vehicles that we um, we have and the cost of those, including the pool cars, but excluding tractors and big trucks and everything like that. So just saying. And uh, you know, are we able to in in this briefing get a comparison with what our other councils sort of do with their um, vehicles and the use? Uh, I think Murray Bridge Council, maybe some of the Riverland councils or Grosser. Uh, in the Copper Coast, perhaps, or, or others, and just um, yeah, just to get that information so we can, you know, um, speak, speak to the community and let them know. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah. So just you, you're asking for a briefing. Yeah. Thank you. Was that in the sustainability of the cars? Or... Uh, it would be. I need to, yeah. need to check yeah. um, whether it was in the next one or it's definitely identified because yeah. it's an asset that we have. Okay. Any further questions without notice? All right. Confidential reports and meal. Next meeting to be held at Manham Council Chambers, Adelaide Road, Manham, 9.30 on Tuesday, the 20th of August. I declare the meeting closed at 12.44 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.